Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 23rd meeting this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item in the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones and so on. And, uh, you know, apart from people who use tablets, uh, that's the only electronic equipment that should be on. I'd also like to note with uh, great sadness the committee learned that Professor Lawrence Mee passed away suddenly last Wednesday. Lawrence had been due to give evidence on the MPAs at last week's meeting and he was highly regarded and respected as an expert in his field and our sympathies are with his family, friends and colleagues. So, agenda item one is subordinate legislation, and uh, we have the first item today to consider the Aquaculture Fisheries Scotland Act 2013 Specification of Commercially Damaging Species Order 2014 and the Protection of Seals Designation of Haul Out Sites Scotland Order 2014. So, members should note that no, mention, uh, no motion to annul has been received in relation to these instruments and I refer members to the papers. Are there any comments? There are no comments. Uh, so as the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments. No? Right, that's the committee's will. Thank you. So agenda item two, Scottish Government's Agricultural Holdings Legislation Review Group Interim Report. Second item today is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lochhead, uh, who is the chair of the group on the interim report uh, produced uh, by the Scottish Government's Agricultural Holdings Legislation Group that follows a session two weeks ago with stakeholders. And we welcome this morning the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lochhead. Hello, uh, Andrew Thin, Ian Mackay and Hamish Lean, uh, all three of you. Uh, will be able to take part as well as uh, you have before or if you've not been in the committee remember that the sound is automatic. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary if there's any opening statement to make uh, first of all. Thank you very much and good morning to the committee. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and I am pleased to have the opportunity to say a few opening remarks about the uh, interim re report of the review group. I think perhaps at the beginning though it would be good to just ask my colleagues who are with me today just to say a little bit about their, their role in the group and, and their background just very briefly before I, I give a few open remarks because I'm very, very grateful to the, the very talented members and hard-working members we have on the review group which has Thank helped you. make this report so effective. So perhaps I'm going to ask Ian Mackay just to say a couple of words and then I'll move along the table. Hi, thanks Richard. Uh, Ian Mackay, I'm a tenant farmer in the Isle of Mull. Uh, also a member of the NFU and work with a new entrance group within the NFU and new entrance group within the Scottish Government. Andrew Thin, I uh, fulfil a wide range of roles in rural Scotland and um, um, I hope bring something of a more broad perspective to the thing. Hello, I'm Hamish Lean. I'm a solicitor in private practice based in Aberdeen. I've been accredited by the Law Society as a specialist in agricultural law since 2000. Okay, so can I just say that we would very much welcome the opportunity to provide you with an update on our progress so far. The interim report was of course published on the 20th of June and marked an important milestone for the future of tenant farming in Scotland. I am very pleased with the warm response we have received from all the stakeholders in Scotland. They in turn of course have also played an important part in the success of the review so far. Over recent years we have all aimed to support the tenant farming sector and improve relationships between tenant farmers and their landlords. While some changes have started to work, you know as well as we all do that this is a very complex and emotive area in agriculture and that agriculture itself is not a static industry. There are still many practical problems faced by tenant farmers and by those in particular who wish to join the proud tradition of tenant farming in Scotland. Tenant farming is a cornerstone of Scottish agriculture and also has a role to play in supporting vibrant and sustainable rural communities across this country. That's why I, as Minister, am absolutely committed to bringing forward better solutions. I certainly knew this was never going to be an easy task. The four aims I set out in the review group were ambitious and very challenging. However, we have already worked hard towards meeting those aims and to deliver our vision for what is a dynamic sector. 
Our vision is, of course, to have a, a tenanted sector that gets the best in the land, gets the best in the people farming it, and provides opportunities for new entrants and forms part of a sustainable future for Scottish farming. As you'll be aware, as part of the process, we set out eight aspirations for the future of the tenanted sector in Scotland. I won't go through them just now, I know you discussed them at your recent session. We have engaged with the industry to ensure we've had the support, however, for these aspirations. And since then, we've focused on identifying the barriers to achieving the aspirations. As part of the process, we have met and talked with over 300 people and received nearly 80 pieces of written evidence. We've also held 10 open meetings in, in Isla, Butte, Ayr, St Boswells, Dumfries, Ra, Inverness, Blair Athol, Glenlivet, Turriff, Inverurie and Perth. So as you can see, the review group, and I've only been at a small number of those meetings, the review group have been at most of them, uh, have been taking place right across Scotland and been a very, very important part of the process. And throughout our visits, people have taken time out, away from the spring lambing, the calving, the silage making and whatever, to speak to us. And many opened their, their homes and met with us to express their views, often behind closed doors because of the nature of some of those issues that they wanted to, to raise with us. We're also very grateful to the stakeholder organisations who have discussed these issues very frankly with us, uh, and indeed with each other, and have gone to great efforts to help facilitate the visits and wider engagements that have taken place across Scotland's farms. The willingness of stakeholder organisations to engage with each other and to have honest and frank discussions has been one of the most positive outcomes of the process so far. A great example of this proactive approach is the Joint Initiative and Rent Reviews, announced by the National Farmers Union, Scottish Tenant Farmers Association and Scottish Land Estates, which of course was in the news just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Andrew Thin played a, a very important role in brokering that ag uh, agreement, and that agreement aims to bring stability and peace of mind to those involved in the rent review process, following the very prominent recent uncertainties that have been in the news. So I strongly welcome the uh, dedication and cooperation shown by all these three organisations and by their representatives in particular, Nigel Miller, David Johnson and Christopher Nicholson. I, of course, as Minister, very much look forward to seeing that initiative develop and I would urge all of the industry, including land agents and their legal representatives, to follow the recommendations that are set out in this joint memorandum. I think it's really important the whole of the industry, all sides of the industry, throw their weight behind that and make it work and make it happen. Now, over the summer, we have focused on the next stage of our work and the three main work streams. Firstly, establishing a stable and effective framework for secure 1991 tenancies. Secondly, creating a new and flexible framework to stimulate diverse other tenancy arrangements. And thirdly, of course, ensuring a, a, a much more supportive, wider, cross-cutting context for the whole of the tenant farming sector in this country. Although it's necessary for the group to have space to develop our thinking in private, we will continue to draw on advice and seek contribution from individuals on specific issues uh, in the coming months. During the autumn, we will engage further with stakeholders to discuss our thinking around potential draft recommendations. By late autumn, we will then begin preparing our final report. So at this stage, it would be wrong for me and my colleagues here today to comment on some of the specific detail of our most recent discussions before our, our views are finally fully formed and agreed. However, we look forward to today's discussion. We'll be as frank as we can with you and as open as we can be against that backdrop because of many of the, the important issues that people want to hear about and you'll want to ask about. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this with you today. Uh, and I, I read the official report from your evidence taking uh, in the last week or two, uh, and that was very illuminating and helpful as well. So thank you for your work as a committee. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to talk about the remit of the, the group um, and if there are any limiting factors in developing the recommendations to deliver the vision for the sector. By focusing on remarks that were made by Christopher Nicholson of the STFA, because I get the sense that uh, tenant farmers around the country are the absolute uh, anchor uh, to rural communities and he expressed it in terms of the future of tenant farming families and their wider role in fragile rural communities in order to make sure that that is part of the, the consideration of the group but the remit has been more um, process driven but the realities of life in the countryside seem to me uh, in many places, islands in particular, but in many parts of uh, our rural areas, that the tenant farmers are the actual grassroots of farming uh, as it was, um, 
that need to have a focus that allows them to choose where they live as well as choose how they live? It's a good question to start with. And as I said in my opening remarks, one of our key aspirations is to ensure that tenant farming plays a key role in underpinning our rural economy in this country. And that's why so many of the issues the review group are addressing are very important from that starting point, because if we want active agriculture in this country, where tenant farming plays a crucial role in delivering that, and we want tenant farming and family farming to be the bedrock uh, of many of our rural communities, then farmers need to attract investment. They need access to land. They need land to farm. So uh, that's why all these issues are so absolutely important for the future of Scotland's rural economy. And you know, I give that assurance to our tenant farmers in Scotland that the, the driving aspiration of all of our work is to ensure that contribution of tenant farming to Scotland's economy and putting food on our tables uh, continues. I'm sure we'll come to these in more detail in a minute, but clearly the ability to make sure that there is more land for letting in due course, when we look at uh, the way in which land has come out of uh, agriculture and ask ourselves, you know, um, are we going to be able to see more land being made available? Uh, because that reduction of uh, thousands of hundreds of thousands of hectares is something which I think we really must uh, look at in terms of the outcome that you drive for in the group's uh, work. And uh, it certainly seems to me that uh, these uh, reductions uh, with 1,006 fewer holdings since 2007 suggest that there's got to be some way to eventually release the land uh, for more tenancies and start-up units and so on. Yes, uh, I'll ask colleagues uh, to chip in at any point they want to, because this is quite a, 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 an important subject, <laughs> broad-ranging. Uh, the key point to make, however, in response to your question, is that yes, there has been a decline in tenanted land in Scotland. Of course, that's one of the primary reasons why we're all here in the first place discussing this. And it's been quite a substantial reduction, uh, as illustrated by the statistics going back to 1982, where there's been a reduction of 42% over that period of let land in Scotland. However, a reduction of let land does not equate to a reduction in land in agricultural production, because a lot of that land is now owned. Therefore, the land, much of it, not all of it, but much of it, is still being farmed. And that's, from Scotland's perspective, a very important point to make clear. Uh, however, I think the, the thrust of your question was, is the review group going to bring forward measures to increase the amount of let land in Scotland? And that touches a whole range of areas, from fiscal measures, taxation, etc., to some of the recommendations we may come out with. But I'll invite colleagues to, to come in with some, a broad question. Andrew wants to come, I think. Um, maybe make a few points. Um, Scotland is one of the lowest percentages of let land in Europe, and I think it's worth making that point as a contextual point. Um, of course, it's absolutely correct that just because land's gone out of tenancy doesn't mean it's gone out of farming. It may well still be in farming. Um, but uh, we're missing an opportunity there because um, what, um, we're, we're not um, enabling external capital to come into this sector. Um, external... Will, Traditionally and historically, people invested in land as a low-risk, low-return low investment. And what's happened in recent times is that investors have come to see it as a low-return, low high-risk investment. And uh, that makes them nervous. That's why there's, there's less investment in tenanted land. If we set out very clearly, I think, in the interim report, that the fundamental thing we have to address is confidence in this sector. Confidence among tenants to invest, and, co and, and I stress this, and confidence amongst landowners to invest. It's not one side or the other. Both sides must be confident. And it's a fundamental truism of any economy, whether it was this sector or whether we were talking about retail in urban Edinburgh, unless investors are confident, whether the owners of the shops or the tenants of the shops, that sector will not grow. Many of the surveys actually looked at the way in which uh, the land is being used that's uh, no longer tenanted in the traditional fashion. I know that we're talking about farmed in hand and the like, you know, but is it being as productive uh, as it would have been were tenant farmers actually active on it from the point of view of Scotland's gross feed uh, product? Well, in terms of... <coughs> 
the, the, the big picture is whilst there's a decline in let land, which is defined, I understand, as land that's let for more than a year, there's, a, there's also, of course, more owned land in agricultural production and more seasonal lets. Now, of course, in terms of the future of tenant farming, there are very relevant statistics because anyone wanting to farm land under a tenancy will want some kind of long-term security and a predominance of seasonal lets or owned land, which reduces the amount of land available for letting, uh, clearly influences to what extent they can have that security. So that's why the issues we're discussing about giving the certainty, the confidence to the whole of the sector, but particularly to tenant farmers, to, to feel they can make a living and have the critical mass of land available to make that happen. Uh, that's why these issues are so important. Yeah. Utilisation of land is very important. It's not just that we'll create more tenancies. There's tenancies out there that are in tenancy just now, we would like to see or aid people to retire out of them and allow a, a new generation into those tenancies so the utilisation of that land is properly and, and all the economics that go along with that in rural areas, you know, that's really important as well. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. I think uh, that... Yeah. Yeah. See that nice point. Sorry. Th th thank you, Convener. And, and, and thank you, Mr Mackay, for, for that comment. Can I just try and get some sense of, of how significant that is, please? I, I guess as a, as a layman in this context, I have really have no idea how productive land can be and how, how much more productive it can be if it's well managed. Are we talking about a factor of one to three from somebody who manages it well to somebody who doesn't? Or would good management give you 10% more rather than three times as much? To give you te technical figures, I wouldn't be able to give you, but if you wanted to go and look at QMS's figures for uh, the top third who produce in this country and the bottom third that produce in this country, you can see a massive gap there. So there is a lot of room for improvement of utilisation of land in this country. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to some of the aspirations of the review group then. Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Gavir, and good morning. Um, when Nigel Middle, uh, Miller was in front of us last week, he said, in terms of the aspirations, we must be a lot smarter. Rather than doing what we did before, we have to create new opportunities. We must consider ways of encouraging more diverse use of the rural economy. We must also be a bit more imaginative. Can I ask what smart and imaginative approaches the review group are considering in order that the eight aspirations referred to earlier by the Cabinet Secretary can be met? Okay. I think that's fundamentally about new letting vehicles. Um, one of the work streams which the group is looking at at the moment is a, a form of agricultural tenancy going forward, uh, which would allow flexibility of arrangements between landlord and tenant with a view to encouraging more land becoming available for let and to allow the parties uh, a, a certain latitude to negotiate the terms of their, their own particular agreement, uh, subject to certain uh, fundamental contract? safeguards being in place. That's, can I ask, is that the same essentially as contract farming? No, contract farming is something different. Contract farming uh, is uh, essentially driven by two main motivations. Uh, first of all, there's a fiscal motivation. The, the, the owner of the land wants to be seen as a farmer for taxation purposes, uh, particularly in regard to inheritance tax uh, and the reliefs which are available for agricultural property, uh, but also, uh, historically at least, because of a fear of security of tenure on, uh, by letting out land. So in a contract farming arrangement, the farmer, um, in inverted commas, contracts with someone who might in other circumstances have been his or her agricultural tenant, but the contracting arrangement provides for the, the, the actual farming policy on the farm uh, and provides for a, usually a basic return, returning to the farmer, uh, a return being paid to the contractor and a surplus then being divided in um, whatever proportions the parties agree. But the, the new letting vehicle wouldn't be contract farming in that sense. It would be a landlord-tenant relationship. Okay. Can, can I ask, given that the industry is calling for smart and imaginative approaches, have there been any suggestions from there as to things that might be implemented that you're considering beyond what we've just discussed? 
Um, yes, we've had a lot of suggestions from the industry. Um, uh, but, but could I just step back slightly and just contextualise your question a wee bit? Large chunk of the tenanted sector is secure 1991 ten tenancies, which in a sense provide the backbone for the tenanted sector. We need in Scotland, in addition to that, to develop a, a range of much more flexible um, uh, letting vehicles to use the term that's just been used. The innovative side, the, 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 if we look forward over the next 20 years, there will be a backbone bit to this industry and there will be an innovative, flexible new bit to this industry. And that's how all industries develop ideas, develop in one bit and then get transferred into the other bit. Um, so an awful lot of what we've had from the industry has been about how to ensure um, um, stable, confident relationships in the 1991 secure bit, the, the backbone. Much less, but to an extent, we've had some reasonable suggestions uh, around the flexibility bit. Um, in particular, we've had some quite good suggestions actually from the landowning sector. They see that because they're investing in the capital. They see that as an opportune area. They, and. I think there is a growing recognition, I wouldn't put it more strongly than that, there's a growing recognition that those who are involved in the backbone bit depend on the innovation driven by the other bit because one feeds the other over time. I, I think it's fair to say that we've still got our work cut out to come out with a really, a really good answer to the innovative bit because it's not only about flexible vehicles, it's also about how do we enable people who are not in this industry at all, who are doing something else, um, the, you know, the, the real innovators of life. Um, how do we get them into this sector to drive change through it? And I, you know, that is going to be very difficult. I don't think we should hide from that. Okay. Thank you. I think to get innovation in this industry is we need to create opportunity. The innovation is out there. It's already there. There's plenty of examples out there of agricultural the practitioners who are very innovative and a lot of modern ideas coming out in agriculture. It's the opportunity. It's very hard to legislate for innovation. It's what we need to do is create the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Convener. I would entirely agree with that last remark from Mr Mackay. Now, just on that very subject, and particularly in regard to one of the aims of this review, which is to encourage new entrants to, uh, to make it easier for them to enter the industry. Um, can I ask specifically whether one of the, whether you have looked at the um, example of share farming, which is, uh, I know practiced, I know it's practiced in New Zealand, I'm sure it's practiced in other, which, which provides exactly uh, that outcome. Is that something that's being looked at? We are very keen on all these examples from the rest of the world and <coughs> One other positive element of this review is the good information we're gathering in about what's happening in this country, and we've got a really good basis of data for the first time ever, but also what's happening in the rest of the world, and that's why I think the, the interim report is good that way, because it's looking at what's not just happening here, but the rest of the world as well, and we've got to learn from that. Uh, so share farming is something that's often been mentioned to me as Minister for the last few years, and I think the review group now has the opportunity to focus on new ideas like that and how they could be implemented in the Scottish context. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone else has got want to come in. This industry is not that different from others in a way. In, any industry that suffers from high barriers to entry struggles to innovate and, struggle, and struggles to develop. Um, this industry, the, the, the barriers to entry in the sense of someone um, becoming the sole proprietor of a farm, the barriers to entry are pretty high. The level of capital involved is enormous. Um, you can lower those barriers significantly if a landlord puts the capital up and you become a tenant, but you, st <coughs> but you still need capital for working capital, quite substantial. So the, the work stream on uh, new entrants and innovation is, it, it, it is looking at a route a root map, which, which, which draws not just from other countries, but from other industries. Um, so, so for example, on the whole, if you, if you take another industry, the, the normal way into it for innovators is you start working in that industry, <coughs> then you start doing a bit in your garage while you're still working in that industry, and then you make stepping stones through. And what we're trying to map out in that work stream is exactly those stepping stones through. Okay, that's quite reassuring, thank you. Very good. Um, We'll move on from there, I think, to Nigel Dawn now. Probably the right to buy, Nigel. Indeed, indeed. Apologies, we'd, we'd leapt on at speed. Um, 
I, I, I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said about the 1991 work stream, so it might be that you're not going to be able to say very much, but I would certainly be interested to know where you feel we might be going with right to buy in 1991 tenancies. And the, I'm trying to... Or any other. Uh, well, yes, I mean, you know, that, 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 that's the issue. Sure. <clears throat> well, clearly we took a, a view that we want to look at that issue because you can't look at the future of tenant farming in Scotland without looking at the right to buy debate. And many tenant farmers, uh, as you're aware, want us to, to look at that, and that's why we're, we're doing that. Um, so it has featured very much in our, our work so far. Many people have put it to the committee that there are circumstances where the right to buy is perhaps the only way forward and it's the best option. Uh, therefore, in our interim report, we've recognised that. We've still got a lot of work to do over the next few months to reach a final view on what role right to buy has to play. But quite clearly, there are examples out there where it's very difficult to see any alternative mm -hmm. to allow that land to be used productively and for the family concerned to, to have a viable future and a better future. So <clears throat> that's where we are at the moment, is we very much recognise the case that's been put to us, that there are circumstances where it could be justified. But we've got a lot of work to do to see under what circumstances it could be implemented, what the consequences of that would be, uh, and, and to how far, how far it should go. I think the evidence that we've heard suggests that a lot of the issues might be dealt with by modifying WAGO, a right of assignation, for example. I, I take it those are, are issues which you're also considering as, as ways of dealing with the whole area of 1991. Yes, I mean, there, there, <coughs> there are so many issues here to mm. ensure that tenant farming remains attractive. And as I said before, you know, the primary ingredients are giving comfort to anyone wanting to take on a farm. It's going to be viable that they are able to invest in it and get a return from running the farm. Mm -hmm. And they can see a long-term future. And they can plan for that. Now... Ian sitting next to me as a, a tenant farmer sees in a much better position to explain what someone requires to make a living out of tenant farming. So maybe I should hand over to Ian. But in terms of the, the wider approach to this, that's, that's what we're looking at. It's how we can supply that confidence and that uh, long-term future for farmers. No, that's absolutely right. It is confidence. It's building confidence. And, and the confidence that you can invest as a tenant farmer, you have a period long enough that you can invest in agriculture and see that return. It is a long-term return in agriculture, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be aware from the landowner's point of view as well, that he has to be investing for the long term as well. You know, the short-term return within land ownership or agriculture just isn't there. So we need to build towards security and confidence in each other to, to move it forward. Thank so you. The compensation that we go on all these issues clearly are all featured in the, in the report and are crucial to give confidence in terms of investment on farm and who gets the return from that. Thank you. I, I get the impression this is clearly a work in progress and, and we look forward to developments. Um, I, I agree. Yeah, I look forward to developments in all of this because this is something that needs to be settled because I don't think there's any doubt at all that the mere mention of a right to buy has had a huge impact over the years on the amount of land that people have been prepared to let. How, confidence, I, I totally agree, is absolutely key to all of this. And as Andrew Thin mentioned in his earlier remarks, and I, and I think Ian Mackay has just said as well, you need confidence on both sides of this equation. The landlord has to have confidence, not just to invest, but to let the land in the first place. My question is quite simple. How do you instill that confidence in the, those that have land to let? How do you instill the confidence to let it when a right to buy exists, especially if that right to buy is absolute rather than preemptive? Is, is, is it possible to achieve that level of confidence with an absolute right to buy in place? Well, we live in a world where there's always going to be de debates over all kinds of issues, and um, <coughs> all political parties in the Parliament have a responsibility to deliver that confidence. Uh, and if we're wanting to give long-term confidence to, to, to landowners in Scotland to let land, uh, however... Having paid close attention to this debate for many years, I don't think we should get bogged down by always thinking that the amount of land that's being made available to let is only influenced by the right to buy debate. There is a whole range of factors out there. Uh, land is a very valuable, overpriced asset in Scotland. 
therefore ownership of land is seen as a um, good thing to, to have. So there's a whole range of factors. There's how the common agricultural policy is delivered and how the payments are distributed. Uh, there's the flexibility that's required that Andrew Thin was referring to in terms of, uh, you know, we all meet farmers in our constituencies and, you know, a farmer will own a farm, he'll have another farm that he lets, and then he'll have a whole series of seasonal lets over and above that. I was speaking to a farmer last week, my constituency has got all these things. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a business decision that that particular farmer's taken, and there's a whole range of uh, commercial considerations and business decisions out there that influence how land is let and when it's let and, and what vehicles are used for letting land. The right to buy debate is about secure tenancies. So let land and the whole debate is about a whole range of vehicles. The right to buy debate, of course, is only about secure tenancies. There is no one on this planet who's ever suggested I'm aware of the automatic right to buy for other kinds of land that's only in terms of secure tenancies. So that's a debate over secure tenancies. May I just briefly convene? Thank you. I, mean, I, mean, I absolutely hear what the Cabinet Secretary says, and I have no doubt that, that he in, intends that to be the case. But as lo uh, you know, this has been the element of the, in the room now for since 2002, I think, when your sure. colleague Fergus Ewing first mentioned it in, in the Rural Affairs Committee. Um, and, and with great respect, I, I think uh, many of these you know, short-term lets and annual lets and grazing lets and other um, contract farming a lot of these have come in as a way round per letting land on any sort of permanent basis. And, and I, I think, I, I absolutely hear what you say, but I do think the biggest uh, inhibitor of people letting land has been this talk of right to buy. And I, I just, um, I haven't really got a question, but what I do want to say is I do hope that whatever the review group comes up with, even if it includes a right to buy in some aspect, it can really put a lid on frankly, the fear that has been um, engendered by just it being in the air, by it being the elephant in the room, yeah. because I, I really do feel that it has been the, the, the greatest constriction of land being let in. And that is where you do make a fair point, and I think I speak for the review group to say we're absolutely determined that this is a landmark review and allows us to move on, and we want to come forward with substantive, fundamental changes no doubt, some radical proposals uh, that will allow us to give certainty to everyone involved in agriculture in Scotland in terms of the, this particular subject and you know, gives the vision and puts the tools in place to make the vision happen and then hopefully it will be a, a landmark uh, review. There is quite a close co correlation between cap and the amount of land that was let and land that was taken back in hand. Mm -hmm. So, yes, right to buy does play a part in it. Uh, but it has been used as a, the elephant in the room too often to say, well, this is the reason we're taking land back in hand. And it's actually the way that CAP had been paid in the past. It was far too easy to claim agricultural subsidies and not actually carry out an agricultural activity on land. Well, I, I, that, I think we'll probably take that as far as we can, but I share the aspiration that the Cabinet Secretary has just uh, and, given words to. Could, could I make two brief points on this? Um, the first is confidence um, comes from certainty. And... So what matters is that people feel that they know what's going to happen. Um, that, that's, that's, that's the absolute fundal, fundamental. The second is, and, and, and it's been a, at the guts of this review, is we need to understand what is driving the calls for a right to buy. Um, because if we don't address that, then the calls for a right to buy will continue, and so uncertainty will continue. So that's the fundamental. And, and the review book group could say, yes, there should be a right to buy, no, there should not, whatever. That won't produce certainty unless it also addresses the, the reasons that are behind the cause. And a big challenge, particularly for the land-owning sector, is to understand what it is that has led to these calls and to address those causes. I wonder if I could uh, just um, throw in a little bit here because I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says about no alternative to the, um, you know, dealing with the impasse of uh, certain secure tenants and uh, the difficulties of working your way through that we look forward to. But it's been clear to me that land uh, could be let in the way that is possible in crofting. I've said this before, but I'll repeat it just now. What do you think about this? Um, there is a right to buy for crofters. Uh, has been the case since 1976. Um, 
it is the case also that we've subsequently made it possible to create new crofts and that these do not have a right to buy attached to them. Is that one of the considerations that you might look at in terms of uh, the creation of new holdings in Scotland for rent for agriculture rather than just crofting? Uh, yes, we are looking at that and of course we are aware of the land reform review group's recommendations relating to small holdings and also aware of the fact that in some parts of Scotland, of course, you can turn your small holdings into a croft and therefore get right to buy. With and great difficulty, it has to be No said. doubt with great difficulty, but that does not apply to other parts of Scotland with the small holdings. So we, we are taking that on board. I don't know if any members want to comment specifically on small holdings. Uh, I'm not, not on small holdings, but just on your specific point. Um, the, the whole conversation around right to buy, has, as, as the Cabinet Secretary said, has been about um, uh, 1991 secure tenancies. What we need to do, uh, I think, is to, uh, over the next 20 years, very significantly expand the supply of other types of tenancies, much more flexible, much more diverse range of tenancies. There's no suggestion um, that there would be, uh, at the moment anyway, no suggestion of a right to buy in there. And if we are also successful in addressing the underlying causes of the cause for the right to buy, then I think we, we, you know, we will lead, that will lead to a sig significant stability. Fine, thank you very much. Um, the next question is complied by Jim Hume. Yes, uh, we've covered uh, some of the points. I, I would like to just put on the record, I think we do have to get trust back into, back into the system. Therefore, it would be interesting just to hear what other, one, uh, other areas, apart from way going, um, obviously, a signation which seem important. There's other, other su things such as rent reviews, etc., which are, uh, could also be up for reform. Be interested in uh, how far we think we can go with that. Scottish Land and Estates, they, they put it on the record that they were concerned that uh, the report would only concentrate on, on 1991 Act tenancies and they'd be, they, they consider that uh, it shouldn't be... Uh, looked at in isolation. With all, all that in mind, I'd be interested to see what you think you can get out of all this reform and what sort of timeline we're talking to, because I don't think we can get total trust and confidence back in the system unless we are where we are when everybody knows where they are and they, they can move on. You mentioned specifically rent reviews. I might ask your colleagues to come in on that. Andrew, in particular, has been heavily involved in that issue recently, but uh, there are uh, a whole range of issues. But in terms of the timescale, uh, clearly the government wants to legislate as soon as we practically can once we've got the recommendations. We can't give an exact timetable clearly because we don't know what the recommendations are and <laughs> you know, how easy or otherwise it will be to legislate and whatever the recommendations are and how many will require legislation because some of the recommendations, I'm confident, will not require legislation. It will be other uh, issues. So. Uh, all I can say at this point in time, we are absolutely determined that certainty will be given to the industry uh, as soon as practically as possible. And in terms of the government's position, we will legislate as quickly as possible and use whichever vehicle is most appropriate. Uh, there's a number of opportunities coming up. And, you know, in this parliament, uh, so if, you if you at all possible. Sorry, but the intention is to look for opportunities in this parliament. This parliament. Okay. But again, I can't give a cast iron guarantee That's any right. of these issues until we know what the recommendations are. So That's it right. depends on the complexity and the legalities surrounding the recommendations. No, in terms of other issues, uh, I think it's probably an appropriate uh, time to ask colleagues to maybe give one or two examples of what they have seen as key issues that we have to address that have come forward from the various meetings mm -hmm. around the country and our work so far. Thanks. So I'll just invite members to any specific <laughs> example that we want to kick off on rent reviews, because obviously rent reviews is a topical issue mentioned. I'll go first. I'll give the others time to think. Um, I think it's very important to be clear that confidence is not just the job of government. Um, and the industry initiative on rents is a powerful signal of what could be done, and I hope will be done, um, that is not really... Yes, the government's had an important catalytic role, but it's an industry-led thing. Um, so I think we, we, we are well. We, we, we are we are thinking about, it and I think very probably we'll make some recommendations, which are not recommendations for government, but will be recommendations for the sector. Um, and these will be around issues relating to the potential role of self-regulation, which is effectively what the rent agreement is about. Its guidelines combined with self-regulation. 
Um, so a potential role for self-regulation in this sector. The importance of leadership in this sector. In, in my experience from working in other parts of the economy, um, you know, where you've got industry bodies at loggerheads with each other, that damages confidence. And where you've got industry bodies working in a, in a, a constructive, collaborative environment, that strengthens confidence. So I think leadership is, is very, very important, and we'll need to say some things about that. And in that mix, and a very important ingredient in that mix, is the role of professional intermediaries, professional agents, whatever you want to call them. They're often not intermediaries in the true sense because they're working for one side. Mm -hmm. um, the role of those people in helping to build confidence and therefore operating in a, a politically sensitive uh, and astute manner is absolutely fundamental. So I, I think it's important that, we, that the review group at the end of this process is absolutely clear that where we have recommendations that are not for government but are for the sector and the players in the sector, that we're very clear about those and I do very much hope and I think they will, but I do very much hope that all the players in the sector will, will, will listen to that and play their part. It's vital that they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a few is another key issue. You know, allowing investment in rural areas, often fragile rural areas, and making that process a lot smoother, uh, and making the agricultural holding more dynamic and more resilient. And diversification plays a huge part in that, so making that a more smooth transition to, to getting diversification would help. What's encouraged me is that uh, as the, the groups progress, the, it seems to have galvanised thinking amongst the, the stakeholder uh, bodies uh, who themselves are now promoting initiatives with regard to, to fixing the problems within the sector. SLE's recent announcement about an amnesty in respect of compensation claims for improvements was a good example of that. Um, a, an outgoing tenant claiming compensation for an agricultural improvement uh, is hidebound by procedural rules, the necessity to have served a notice in advance before carrying out the improvement and so on. That was an issue which was raised with uh, the group at various meetings across the country. <laughs> SLE are proposing uh, a means of fixing that by, uh, in essence, doing away with the need to have served uh, a notice in advance. That's a helpful suggestion. The discussions amongst the stakeholder uh, groups um, facilitated by Andrew, which has led to the, the recent announcement about rent review initiative, uh, that's another example of that. I mean, uh, I would just uh, sort of put, put on the record also, I mean, two weeks ago we saw quite a, a difference when we had the Scottish land and the state's NFUS and the STFA here in, in, in their body language and, and, and the words that we were saying, which we all, th I think, thought was quite constructive. Of course, not all people out there are members of NFUS, Scottish uh, Tenant Fan Farmers Association, or, or SLE, which is something we have to bear in mind, of course. And they may be leaders, but they're not, they're not rulers. But anyway, yeah, I think. And yeah. Dave Thompson and yeah. Claudia Bibby. Just on the point of consensus, um, at last week's session, both the NFUS and the STFA, I think it was, expressed the view that it would be helpful to have a mandatory code of practice for land agents in the sector. I, I'm sure you will have taken reams of evidence on, on, on the issues of the conduct of rent reviews. I'm just wondering, is that something the review group is likely to come to a view upon, make recommendations on, or does that really sit out, what you're, sit out with what you're trying to do? I think your question links in very nicely to Jim Hume's finishing point there, which is that whilst there's a lot more constructive working across the sectors, ultimately the people you met and that we deal with don't have control over every single landowner or landlord or tenant farmer in Scotland. <laughs> Uh, and that then leads us to the debate of voluntary versus statutory in terms of taking forward some of these issues. Clearly, not just from a selfish government point of view and not wanting to legislate too much, but from the terms of building a better atmosphere and environment in Scotland, the voluntary route, of course, is the best route because it just leads to more constructive relationships and, as I said, you know, a better environment mm. in which to work and to, to live. Therefore, that is a preference. Of course it is. And we welcome the recognition from all sectors that working together is really important and that we have many common objectives here. 
You know, one of my main issues is that we have to, as a country, recognise we need people in this country to work the land, produce food. That's in the interest of everyone, whether you're a, a landlord or a tenant or a member of the public. We want to support that. And it's in everyone's interest to drive towards that and make it happen, for commercial reasons as well as for uh, national interest. However, to what extent we have to go down our statutory routes, uh, you know, we will look at carefully. But we can't rule it out. Of course we can. There will be legislative change that will result from this review in one shape or form. But to what extent and where the statutory route applies to is still to be decided. Uh, and will be guided by experience. Uh, we know about the court cases, we know about the controversial issues, and we'll be guided by how the sectors respond to those issues. If there's an inadequate response, we will be left with no option but to look at the statutory route. Uh, if there's a good response and things improve, clearly that takes the heat off the, the need for statutory solutions. Okay. Uh, Dave Thompson. And, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> I remember attending a meeting in Tour, the Tour Hotel, in 2002, uh, about the, the right to buy. Uh, uh, Andrew, in fact, was there. He was advising. Was that the inaugural meeting, I think, of the um, certainly the campaign for, for right to buy? Um, and I moved a motion at the SNP conference later that year uh, on that very subject, which I think maybe help to move the SNP's position on in relation to that. So I'm very interested in the subject. That's 12 years ago, and we're still talking about it. Um, it it's very interesting. If we look at issues like investment, improvements, compensation, way go, retirement and releasing of land, succession, and so on, a lot of these, or a good bit of it, I believe could be dealt with through assignation. Now, I know that assignation is not a silver bullet, but to quote Christopher Nicholson of the STFA, he stated in his oral evidence uh, to us that uh, assignation is potentially a real game changer. So a game changer, maybe it's not a silver bullet, but it's pretty important, I would have thought, for the viability of secure tenants in, secu in ensuring that investment continues in the future. I would maybe just ask the panel to elaborate a bit more. I know we've already touched on this and talked about it on the issue of assignation because assignation with certain other changes to the need to register, for instance, right to buy and so on, may well be a way forward that would allow us to um, deal with the issue of uh, right to buy. Uh, and I would agree with the Cabinet Secretary, by the way, that I've not heard anybody other than uh, some members of the NFU Scotland saying that right to buy would apply to non-secure tenants. In my view, every political person I've talked to, apart from one or two, um, on, on the kind of landowner side, uh, are very clear that nobody is has ever, and I certainly have never, and that inaugural meeting never talked about any kind of right to buy other than for secure tenants. But on the assignation thing, thing uh, is that something that would be a game changer and could it deal with uh, much of this problem, if not all of it? That issue is a really important issue which is, I think, dominating quite a lot of our thinking and I'm sure all members may want to come in on this particular point because it relates to opening up opportunities for future uh, farmers. And the security that new entrants or farmers who want to get a more secure tenancy uh, are seeking, uh, clearly it is very relevant to how assignation could play a role. Uh, one of the big issues for me in this whole debate is opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we all meet farmers in our constituencies that are across Scotland who want to farm until the drop because they don't see any way of moving on mm. or you know, opening up opportunities for others to take over their business or, or their tenancy. So assignation is very crucial to all of that and very central. Uh, and yes, it could potentially be a game changer if we were to find a way of uh, reviewing how uh, or, or the flexibilities around assignation. One concern I will put on the table is, and I think Nigel Miller 
reflected in this when he was giving evidence to you is as soon as you attach a, a, attach a financial value to anything in life, those with the deepest pockets see an opportunity mm. and there's always a danger of consolidation. Uh, and I don't want to be in a position in agriculture that we have in the fishing industry where consolidation is the result of attaching a value to something that's a fundamental right of people. Mm. So, therefore, potentially a game changer, we'd have to think very carefully about how it would be introduced if there was a financial value attached to it. But certainly it would open up opportunities if it could be done, potentially. So I'll, I'll ask members to give their views because it's something we're, we're talking about and thinking about. Yeah. I don't know who wants to come in. If you've got views. We are looking at assignation, uh, looking at it very seriously. But we're looking at all aspects of assignation because it would range, I suppose, uh, at one end of the spectrum from a simple right to assign a secure 1991 Act tenancy as a secure tenancy to a, a third party, or perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, a right to assign uh, a tenancy which then goes through a conversion process into a, a fixed duration tenancy of some sort or somewhere in between the, the, the two ends of the spectrum. So we are looking at all of that. We're very conscious of the possible unintended consequences as described by uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, if we um, introduce our signation as an exit route for tenants um, in order to, to fund a retirement, uh, that will not necessarily uh, allow tenancies to move on to new entrants because, of course, the outgoing tenant quite rightly will want to sell mm. at the highest possible price. Mm -hmm. um, another aspect of assignation that we're looking at is whether or not we widen the, the class of uh, family member who would be entitled to have the tenancy assigned to them. Uh, so all of these things are, are, are things that we're actively considering. Yeah, just a very brief comment. Um, uh, undoubtedly a game changer if we get it right. Um, the challenge is this issue about consolidation. Um, um, I would just like to put to one side the new entrant, because I think, as I said earlier, we need a, a sort of route in for new entrants. New units are not going to step into in one jump. Um, but let me just give you an example of the sorts of quite, quite um, innovative thinking that might, that might help here. If, if, um, if the right was to assign into a limited duration tenancy, but the duration was until the incoming tenant was 65, then the value would depend on how young the incoming tenant was. And that might help a great deal with the consolidation point. So it's that kind of thinking that needs to be done here, I think. Yeah, I, think I was just going to back up what Andrew Thun was saying, is that it, it does cut across a lot of issues and resolves a lot of uh, problems, and it possibly isn't a route in for new entrants, mm -hmm. although through SRDP there is funding available for new entrants. So, as Andrew says, with time scale and some funding from SRDP, you could possibly compete as a new entrant uh, to get into you know, these assignations, or be able to afford an assignation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's fine. Claudia Beamish. Uh, sorry, uh, but just before you do, if it's on that point. That. Very point, convener. Thank you. I, I just wonder whether you uh, are considering um, if uh, in, in, in the... Sorry, start again. On assignations, would you consider it apt for uh, the landowner of the farm where the tenancy is being assigned having the right to take on the assignation when it became available? Well, that's a very controversial question, <laughs> simply because we're trying to protect let land and, and tenancies in Scotland. So clearly, you know, we've not reached any conclusions at all. And this is, you know, one of the issues that certainly came to prominence during the, the initial stages of the review and interim report. So now we've got to look at all the issues you're discussing today, and, and we're trying to give you some idea of some of the options that have been discussed. Uh, but clearly we'd have to think carefully about the consequences of that in terms of the amount of light land available in Scotland and, and so on and so forth. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Yes. Thank you, Convena. Good morning to you, Cabinet Secretary, and to the panel. Um, could I take us back to investment in relation to the secure tenancies, um, which you've, you've touched on already in this morning's evidence? 
Um, in, in the interim report under the investment section, I was interested, I think it goes from um, 117 to um, 122. I was interested, and I, I want to preface this remark by saying that I agree with um, my, my colleague on the committee, Jim Hume, that there was certainly a positive atmosphere in, in the evidence-taking that we had from the range of groups um, when we did that recently. But I, I, I just would like comment on, um, in 118, if I could just read it out, that SLE believes that tenants are currently subject to broadly equivalent flexibilities and constraints to those that characterise the owner-occupied sector. And SLE state, lenders tell them that what matters most is a clear and robust business plan, regardless of whether the business operates on owner or rented property, taking into account the wider assets of the business. Um, now, I just would like any comment on that from the panel. And just within the, the context of um, remarks and, and evidence that I've heard from STFA and from individual tenants in South Scotland, where I represent, that the investment is extremely difficult, perhaps specifically because they are tenants. And I would just wonder if, in terms of taking the whole review forward, whether there's any comment on that. Um, yes, and we, we, we've, we've met with some bank uh, representatives to make sure we really understood what we were talking about here. So th this is actually not that different from other parts of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone lending money will first of all look at um, the person they're lending it to. Mm -hmm. uh, are they competent? Are they credible? Have they got a track record? Second, <laughs> secondly, they'll look at their business plan. Does it stack up? Uh, and then thirdly, they'll look at issues around collateral. Now, it's that third area where tenants are in difficulty because they tend not to have collateral of any great extent. Um, and so that's where we've focused our attention. Um, and uh, to, just to link this back to the assignation point, part, but only I stress part, of the attraction of an assignation route is that it potentially creates collateral that would, allow, that would, would strengthen the tenant's ability to invest. But it's not a silver bullet, and it's, not, it's still the case. If a tenant is not credible or hasn't got a, a business plan that stacks up, they won't get investment. But it undoubtedly would help. And that's the message we got from the bank. So. I think it becomes increasingly difficult if you're a new entrant, because you have no history, you have no credible track record. And when you go, you have some fantastic business plans, possibly better than some of the older more established tenants putting in a business plan. Uh, they just all they're looking for is the credibility, your history. So some of the vehicles we're looking at share farming options. It gives you that credibility to then go and look at getting finance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alec Ferguson on uh, other yeah. Um, th thank you, Kavita. We've already mentioned quite um, in, in answer to a number of the questions. The 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 variation of tenancy arrangements that exist out with the 1991 secure tenancies. Um, and obviously there are quite a wide range of them, which I don't need to, to repeat. And, and although I'm afraid I was unable to be at the meeting two weeks ago, the stakeholders meeting, there was quite a discussion around them. Um, and, and some of it became quite focused on freedom of contract, about which there was a um, completely opposing views, I think it would be fair to say, shown by, um, for instance, the Chartered Surveyors and the NFUS, who seem to be quite in favour of them, and SDFA, who I think said if um, business tenancy is patently not the answer for the tenanted sector in Scotland. So th there's obviously a wide range among stakeholders of, of the, the value of some of these things. Um, and also I noticed that SDFA stated um, that they were deeply disappointed the future of limited partnership tenancies seemed to be beyond the, the, the range of, of this review. To sort of start a discussion on all of that going, I just wonder whether the panel, the group, has found that this sort of the, the range of current tenancy arrangements has helped move towards the vision that you have or, or hindered that, that journey, if I can call it that. And maybe you'd like to comment on, on if you can, on what are the lessons to be learnt from the farm business tenancy system south of the border? Um, or do you, envisage, do you envisage that perhaps having a place um, in the future, or do you think we need other more innovative ways of, of approaching the whole issue? Clearly, when we're debating the options for delivering greater confidence and security, the first thing that any 
prospective tenant or existing tenant will say to you is they need to know they're going to have a farm, <laughs> to farm, for a substantial amount of time to allow them to invest and, and make a living. Uh, so that's why security of tenure is so important in this debate and how we can give long-term <coughs> certainty to tenants to enable agriculture in Scotland as well as landlords. Therefore, freedom of contract, many people argue, of course, is exactly the opposite of that, that long-term security is not exactly the central aim of freedom of contract. However, to pick up on what Andrew Thin said earlier on, looking at the needs of Scottish agriculture and Scottish tenant farming, we need flexible vehicles out there. So that's why we need a mixture because Scotland's very diverse. I gave examples of you know, farmers we all meet who have a variety of uh, arrangements in place because they, they have to adapt with, with farming. They, I mean, again, I always feel silly sitting next to Ian Mackay talking about what farmers do, but you know, from my experience speaking to farmers, they have to be able to adapt maybe year on year in some cases, hence seasonal lets, but they need the core farm, the core activity to be uh, secure for the long term. So freedom of contract south of the border is not that popular with many tenant farmers speaking in Scotland, but clearly in having a range of vehicles available, we need, do need more flexibility in some circumstances. So I'll, I'll let others come in because we've got a farmer here and others who've been taking a close interest in this as well. No, absolutely right. It's, uh, the core business needs to be secure, but you need that dynamic movement uh, with other land available. So it does fit in, you know, some uh, you know, so structured arrangements do fit in with the agricultural system, but you do need that security. Any of the, the, the tenancies I see that work really well, they do have a secure hub, whether it be owner-occupier or a good long-term tenancy as, as the base of their business is vitally important to, to any agricultural business trying to grow. Can I just do one, one final point before we open up? Sorry, if you don't mind. I, I did notice with... with, with um, uh, pleasure, I think, that in, in, in the report that there is a sentence that states at the same time we've heard positive stories of great relationships between landowners and tenants that are overcoming all the issues to enable and promote thriving modern tenanted farms. And I'm, I'm glad that was mentioned because there are obviously perfectly good examples around the country, all around the country, where these arrangements work really well. Um, ha have you been able to identify what, if you like, creates that relationship? And have you been able to, to use whatever it is that does. Is there, is there a, a unifying factor in what creates that relationship? Factor maybe the operative word, I'm not sure there. Um, but have you been able to identify anything? And if so, are you likely to be able to translate that into the recommendations that you make? The, 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 um, the, there's, a, there's a work being streamed specifically on, on this relationship issue because it is so fundamental as you absolutely rightly identify. Um, it's very difficult for governments to legislate to make people behave themselves. And that's a problem in, in the sense that, for, for a review like this, how do, we, how do we produce recommendations about how to have good relationships? Um, that said, I think there are, you know, I, I think there are some clear emerging themes here, which, which is partly just about people behaving themselves, but it's also partly more structural, and it's about, it's around this issue of so-called intermediaries who are not intermediaries, they're acting for one side. And it's around the potential for short-termism to creep into that relationship, because if you're on a short-term contract, well, you just go and maximize the rent, never mind whether you've damaged the relationship in the process. Um, so we will, I think, make some pretty clear uh, um, recommendations, which will not be, I don't think, about new statute, but will be about how the sector, and I, I mean, I come back to my point about so much of this is going to be about the sector recognizing that it's in its own behaviors that, that confidence will grow from. Uh, and, and they must not, it's so important that everybody in this sector understands that if they sit in their, on their hands and wait for government to sort it, A, it won't be sorted, and B, it'll be sorted in a, in a manner which actually may not be particularly flexible and helpful. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds very simple that's come through from these relationships work very well. It's close communication. 
just as simple as that. And you can't really legislate for that, but it is about communication and understanding what each party wants. I, I, I fundamentally agree with that, and thank you for it. Thanks, Kevin. What do you mean, Mish? You know, um, could, could I turn our mind specifically to the limited partnerships um, and get some views from the panel on this? Um, I, I just quote the STFA, which said in their uh, written evidence, um, limited partnership tenancies must not, must not be brushed under the carpet or relegated to the all-too-difficult box. Their future will have been complicated by the Salveson Riddle uh, debacle, but STFA would urge the review group to engage with this group of tenants to explore a way forward for them. Um, within the context of, of that comment, and there'll obviously be different comments from other groups who have, have, have commented on this, um, I have the concerns of one tenant constituent who has a, a limited partnership um, post Salveson Riddle that um, the mediation is not materialising and he has fears of being, as he puts it, railroaded into the land court. And I wonder the degree to which um, the review will look at this issue, uh, because in terms of the vibrancy of the future tenanted sector, it is a, a serious concern. This may be, it is evidence, you know, from one constituent. So it may be that this is not um, more broad, but I do want to raise it because I have a concern. I'll give a, a quick overview of my understanding of, of the debates around the limited partnerships, and I'm sure colleagues will want to talk about to what extent it will be taken on board by the review in the coming months. Uh, firstly, limited partnerships, of course, play a, a, an important role in, in agriculture. But I think people have persuaded me that the origins of limited partnerships is that it's been seen as an easier alternative to long-term secure arrangements, which may have benefited uh, tenant farming in particular in Scotland. So therefore, our challenge is to have alternative vehicles to limited partnerships that do provide more long-term security of, of tenure uh, to the tenancy sector. Uh, and limited partnerships, by their very nature, are less secure and can be brought to an end quite easily compared to other arrangements. So that's the challenges we face, uh, is the alternatives to limited partnerships and making sure they're available and attractive and work. And in terms of Salves and Riddle, the mediation will be put in place, clearly because the mediation we're wanting to set up, as we've discussed previously at committee, for those uh, tenants affected by the, the ruling it involved three parties, unlike usual mediation, which is between two parties. In this case, it's three parties. It's uh, landlord, tenant, and Scottish government. <laughs> so it's things are a bit more complicated, and we have to get the legalities right before we enter into the proper mediation. But it will be delivered, and I've asked my officials to uh, give me a report on what progress is being made so we can make sure that we deliver it very, very soon, because I'm aware of the concerns expressed by the Scottish Tenant Farming Association. So uh, I'm taking that seriously, just to give you some comfort on the mediation. We'll get the arrangements up and running as soon as possible. Uh, so I'll invite other members to come in in terms of uh, limited partnerships, the role they play, and how we could perhaps uh, address them moving forward. Um, I can say something about limited partnerships. I mean, essentially, um, from a historical perspective, they were simply a vehicle to avoid security of tenure. Um, uh, that was the sole reason for their creation. Um, since 2003, um, general partners and limited partnerships who receive a termination notice have been able to extend their occupation for a period of at least three years beyond the end of the limited partnership by serving the, the requisite notices. The Salveson Riddle case was all about the, the uh, for use of a better term, the 3rd February notices which were served as the bill was going through the, the Scottish Parliament when uh, uh, many landowners, for want of a better word, panicked and served termination notices, even though they weren't due to come to an end uh, several years hence. Uh, that's what Salveson v Riddle was all about, and uh, the, whether or not the retrospective legislation which turned those particular general partners into secure tenants uh, was within the power of the, 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 the Scottish Parliament or not. Um, ultimately, we discovered that it wasn't within the, the power of the Scottish Parliament. However, uh, there are uh, 
looking at the statistics, something like 517 limited partnership tenancies still out there as at 2013. The, although very, very serious indeed for those affected, the number affected by the Salveson v Riddle case uh, is a relatively small number. Um, I can only uh, echo what the Cabinet Secretary uh, says about the, the, the flexible letting vehicles that we are hoping to introduce being a, a way forward for those uh, general partners and will give them opportunities to, to continue in occupation. Covered that subject. Anyone else for a comment? No. Yes. Okay. Fine. Uh, Claudia Beamish, you have another question about wider cross-cutting contexts. Thank you, convener. Uh, we, we've um, we've looked at uh, the the broad issues. Um, it's come up several times this morning about um, the ne necessity of positive relationships and how, they, although they can't be legislated for, that there is a leadership issue which um, yourself, Andrew, Andrew, has raised and and others have, have touched on this. In terms of the supportive wider cross-cutting context, um, the review, review group, as I understand it, questions whether um, there are ways of ensuring whether cap and taxation are either neutral or positively encouraging to the letting of agricultural land. And the recent announcements on cap reform have included measures under both pillars specifically targeted, as we've heard, to new entrants. Um, including eligibility for basic farm entitlements. And there is also uh, application to the National Reserve. At committee on um, August the 6th, there was also discussion with stakeholders more broadly about the relationship uh, between landlords and tenants. And issues related to a supportive, wider cross-cutting context um, have been covered in responses to this paper um, by the remit of the review group. But there are some suggestions in written evidence that um, there may be other issues that could help with the wider cross-cutting context. Um, Sava outlines the implication, and I quote, of government intentions to convert significant areas of rural land to forestry. Taxation and, and then I re-quote, the hardest but most important area to influence is um, psychology. So are there comments on... Uh, further comments, other than what's been said this morning on the supportive wider cross-cutting context um, and how the review panel might influence the psychology of um, potential landlords as well, in, uh, sort of, in obviously in relation to confidence and other issues. So rather a long question, but I needed to set yeah, the context. Okay. Well, I am tempted to say that in four weeks' time, the, the people of Scotland will have the opportunity <laughs> yes. to deliver tax powers to this Parliament and financial independence that will enable us to tackle some of these fundamental issues affecting how our land is used in this country and how to incentivise the creation of tenancies in this country. Well, there, I've said it. Okay. So I was tempted and I've said it. You're tempted. You're tempted. <laughs> yes, Cabinet Secretary. So these, these debates are very, very relevant. It's come to temptation. These, be, these, these issues are very, very relevant. And ironically... You know, we are spending a lot of time and energy looking at very serious issues in relation to this debate, yet if we had taxpayers in this parliament, there are some fun fundamental changes we could potentially take that would have a big impact on the availability of let land in Scotland. So it is a very important um, point of the debate, and in past years I've made representations to UK chancellors who have uh, not even replied to my representations about trying to take into account the, the needs to incentivise let land and, and budgets. So <clears throat> these are important issues, and hopefully we'll have more of a say over them uh, uh, in 2016 onwards if we get a yes vote in September. Other issues that are cross-cutting, clearly Could you Could I just go back to that very briefly, yeah. Cabinet Secretary, just in relation to the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, which has been looking at this evidence um, about taxation. I wonder whether you have any comment on, on, or any other members of the panel have any comment on what the UK government could do in relation to taxation as well. It might be um, helpful at this stage just to get some balance into the discussion. I'm, I'm happy, I'm not sure it will give much balance, but I'm happy to respond <laughs> to that because uh, the, uh, I welcome the fact that the Scottish Affairs Committee is looking at the role taxation and fiscal measures could play in the land reform debate, mm. uh, which in turn relates to this, and I'm going to come on to that in terms of other cross-cutting issues. Yeah. Uh, however, our, 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 our experience of successive UK governments is there's zero interest in looking at tax and fiscal measures in relation to land 
that would help address this debate. Mm -hmm. And that's just an unfortunate reality that uh, the UK government or, or the Westminster Parliament have a track record of not touching tax measures that could help free up land in Scotland for, for letting. Hopefully that may change one day. Uh, and therefore, if the Scottish Affairs Committee can give more prominence to the role taxation could play, uh, that's a good thing. But we can take these powers into our own hands and not have to rely on the Scottish Affairs Committee being listened to by unsympathetic Westminster governments. But in terms of other cross-cutting issues, I want to talk about forestry and, and land reform, because clearly the Land Reform Review Group did address some of these issues. And as you know, just last week we announced the Forest Commission let, which is going to a new entrant uh, in the Inverness area. And I think there's a really big debate to be had there about how we use Scottish land and publicly owned land to help encourage let land and new entrants and create new tenancies. Mm -hmm. So the new starter units that have been created by the Forestry Commission, I think, are, are bold and radical, but do show a way in which things can be done in the future. And the Land Reform Review Group flagged up some measures that could potentially be taken to, to, to take that debate forward. So that, common agricultural policy payments and how they're applied, uh, all impact in this debate. So these cross-cutting issues are very, very important. I'll invite members, though, to, to raise any that have come to their attention uh, over the last few months, because there are a number of cross-cutting issues. Review. Possibly slightly beyond the remits of this group, but forestry, I'm quite passionate about forestry, being a farmer. Uh, the, I, I think a great opportunity was missed when uh, grants were laid out for planting uh, immunity woodlands. If it had been more integrated with agriculture, there's a lot of agricultural land out there that's unmanageable. The people aren't there to manage it anymore. And with sympathetic planting, these areas could become manageable once again. I'm sitting in a place, uh, tenanting a place of my own, that was planted and has made the management a lot easier and a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to look at all those issues uh, and integrate them more closely. And again, just backing up what Cabinet Secretary said there, uh, CAP, the, the new CAP uh, should help, you know, closer look at activity and you know blacklisting as well uh, all these issues should help that lands utilized properly and mm -hmm. subsidy can't just be claimed merely because you have a, a chunk of land that's eligible and one of the motivations for choosing the 2013 trigger dates for land that qualifies for cap payments uh, as opposed to 2015 mm -hmm. was the the case put by the scottish tenant farmers mm -hmm. association and others that we should try and not incentivize taking land back in hand to take advantage of the new payments. So that helped protect, hopefully, uh, some let land in Scotland. I will account the fact that this committee unanimously said that that was a good idea as well. I was just about to make that point. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important contribution, of course, was this committee's report, which you sent to me, uh, supporting the, the case put by uh, various sectors. Could I just respond to your psychology point? Um, history has left us with a set of cultural attitudes, behaviours, dress, all sorts of things in rural Scotland, which, which in urban Scotland have largely evolved on from there, but are still there, quite prevalent in, urban, in rural Scotland. And I do think that that underpins, um, in a cross-cutting way, some of the challenges that we're addressing here. And at the risk of repeating myself, um, one of the key outcomes from this review, which is only partially in the gift of government, is a need for really um, robust leadership on all sides here that moves rural Scotland on from that history. Okay, um, that's good. I think we've uh, rounded off that one. Yes. Um, process issues, and uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Convener. Um, the the committee has uh, heard that stakeholders are generally very supportive of the review group's uh, work to date, uh, with uh, Scottish Land and Estates saying that they are quite optimistic, uh, to quote them, uh, that the, the outcome will be productive and will result in a more vibrant tenanted sector in Scotland. Uh, also, the NFUS said that the current review process is an opportunity for significant change uh, and a new collaborative approach. So it's all very encouraging uh, comments um, from, from that side. However, uh, there's also been a call from uh, RICS or, or RICS uh, for a moratorium on any legislative change uh, for at least 10 years 
uh, signed up by all the major political parties uh, in this parliament. Um, given that uh, um, certainty has been highlighted as, as imperative this morning uh, on a few occasions, and given that there seems to be a, a remarkable degree of consensus on, on this with regard to maintaining stability, uh, do you see that continuing in the short to long term? Um, and how will you ensure that stakeholders are kept on board throughout uh, the rest of the process and beyond? Well, clearly the committee has now got the task of coming up with the recommendations and proposals. And we're not going to be naive enough to sit here and think that every single recommendation we may come up with will be warmly welcomed by every single uh, stakeholder in Scotland. We will just have to wait and see. However, I think it is fair to say there's a degree of consensus. We're all trying to get to the same place here. And whilst I can't speak for other political parties, one of the Scottish Parliament's attributes is we are able to reach consensus on a number of important issues. And this committee, of course, has got a key role to play. So I'll be paying close attention to the views of this committee. And I expect you'll be hopefully following up your evidence sessions with um, some kind of communication to the government and the review group, and obviously the review group in particular, uh, over what we've been debating. So our aim will be to keep the spirit of cooperation and constructive dialogue and hopefully consensus going right to the end. And thereafter, if, if we do deliver effective proposals and recommendations, then that in turn hopefully will attract support and mean that Parliament as a whole will think the job's done and we can move on. So that's our challenge as a review group. But clearly, it's in the hands of Parliament to take decisions on these issues. But I, I think there's, there's, there's hope for that. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Yep. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much for that um, optimistic mood in which we meet today and uh, look forward to your uh, deliberations and delivery by about the end of this year. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his uh, supporting members of the, uh, the review group, and uh, we will have a five-minute break just now before we change over uh, panels. And uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your evidence.
We're ready to start again now. Um, so, uh, this is agenda item three. I welcome you back to the third and final item today. And this is for the committee to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, on the Scottish Government's designation of marine protected areas following on last week's stakeholder session. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary once again. Uh, and good morning uh, to David Mallon, the Head of Marine Environment Branch, and David Palmer, the Acting Head of Division in Marine Planning and Policy at the Scottish Government. Gentlemen, if the Cabinet Secretary wish to say something to start off with, please do. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you to the Committee for the opportunity to discuss our work in marine protected areas in Scottish waters. And of course, I read the official report from last week's session, uh, session with interest, so it's good to, to see the committee continuing to take a close interest in, in this innovative area of policy. Before I outline our work on the MPAs, I would like to echo the convener's initial remarks at the beginning of today and say that I was very sorry to hear about Lawrence Mee's uh, very sudden death last week. Uh, Lawrence was, of course, director of the Scottish Association for Marine Science at Oban and was due to give evidence to your committee. He has been a major figure in the marine science community in Scotland for many years, and of course he was very, very enthusiastic about what was being achieved in this country, and he was very closely involved with that. His directorship of SAMS was characterised by energy and enthusiasm, and he helped to solve some of the big marine challenges for people and environment in this country. And of course he'll be sadly missed, and I would like to add my condolences uh, to his uh, loved ones and his colleagues and Sam's and friends. I'd now like to make a short opening statement about our work on the MPAs, which form, of course, a major part of our strategy for nature conservation. Scotland seas are world renowned for the biodiversity, and it's vital that we protect them. Our seas, as I'm sure the committee are aware, is, are the fourth largest in the whole of the EU and support many habitats and species, including cold water coral reefs and 22 individual species of whales and dolphins. Scotland also has five million seabirds, that's one for every person in this country, and is home to almost half of the European Union's breeding seabirds. Current and future generations should be able to continue to enjoy the vast array of marine species and habitats that depend on our seas. And only by protecting these seas can industry also continue to benefit from the natural capital and services that they provide to our society. Looking back, the Scottish Parliament took the decision to recognise the importance of marine protected areas by including them as a key element of the Marine Scotland Act. Parliament placed a legal duty on ministers to create an MPA network and supported my call for offshore marine conservation to, devolve, to be devolved to Scotland as well. After the Act was passed in 2010, Marine Scotland initiated a project to identify the inshore and offshore MPAs to include in the network. And last month, uh, and that's why we're here today, I designated 30 marine protected areas in Scottish waters. The MPAs were identified to represent our species and habitats, including flame shell beds, feather stars, common skate, and ocean quahog as well, which is a, lar a large mollusk which can live for centuries. They will also protect sand eels, which many seabirds and marine mammals depend on for food, and black guillemot, the only seabird not currently protected under the EU Birds Directive in special protected areas. The largest MPA is North East Faroe Shetland Channel, at approximately 23,000 square kilometres almost the size of the whole of the Scottish Highlands, and that's the largest MPA in the whole of Europe. So these MPAs bring the total marine protected area coverage to 20% of Scotland's seas, and that is within the 10 to 30% targets that have been called for by scientists and in international conservation agreements. When developing the network, we took account of a wide range of factors, including geographical range and variation, whether species and habitats were threatened or declining, and the need for replication and connectivity. We outlined our proposed approach to Parliament in autumn 2010 and our progress in our report to Parliament in December 2012. We then consulted on the MPA proposals in 2013 and of course, as you're aware, we had an unprecedented response to the consultation from a, a wide range of interests, including many local communities around Scotland. In total, we received just under 15,000 responses, most were in favour of an MPA network and an independent review supported NSA an independent review supported SNH and GNC scientific advice. We worked hard to outline the consultation, in the consultation how we expected each MPA to be managed. That work, of course, has to continue, and it will continue in dialogue with our marine industries and other interests to ensure that we get the appropriate management put in place. 
Last month, I also announced new proposals to protect seabirds, basking sharks and marine mammals. And we now plan a public consultation on those proposals to complete the network. And I look forward to communicating progress to Parliament in the near future. So again, I just want to emphasise that because we are very lucky in Scotland, we've got the responsibility for 20% of Europe's waters. We have so many unique species and habitats that we should all take pride in what is innovative and landmark legislation that's been passed by the Scottish Parliament in recent years and which has now resulted in 30 marine protected areas being designated in Scottish waters. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> we'll move to the discussion about the selection and designation process first. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Convener, <coughs> and thank you again, gentlemen, this morning. Um, can, I, can I just say, first of all, that um, I'm, I'm very supportive of these designations, and, and, and I think it's uh, something that uh, is uh, very much needed, and I'm particularly pleased that the industry in general, uh, you know, is supportive of what's being done as well, and that's, uh, that's quite an achievement, I think, uh, Cabinet Secretary, especially to bring the fishermen on board, although I know not all fishermen are entirely happy. I'd like to pick up on one, a couple of points, actually, and it's to do with sand eels in particular, um, and the uh, Firth of Forth Banks Complex uh, MPA, where there appears to be competing interests there in terms of possible offshore wind developments and the conservation of sand deals. Um, and, and I note that the species hasn't been included as a feature on that particular site. And then on a more broad point about sand deals, um, they have been included in the broader network for conservation rather than for recovery. I just wonder if, if you have any comments to make on the, the issue of sand eel, which is a very important food species for, for many uh, other fish and birds, and, and whether indeed we should be making any sort of representations to, the, to, to Europe about fishing them at all. Uh, and I know some European countries do, although we don't tend to do that here. So the, the two points there, the, the banks and the Firth of Forth, uh, and then the, the broader issue of sand deals. Thank you. <coughs> it was remiss of me not to say that I've got the two Davids with me, uh, David Mallon and David Palmer, uh, from the Scottish Government and... Uh, I think you've both been in position since day one, since we started this journey a few years ago, which is a huge relief to me as Minister, uh, and they've uh, certainly played a huge role in getting us to where we are today. So I may call on uh, colleagues to talk about their experience dealing with stakeholders over some of these issues. In terms of the sand deals issue, uh, three inshore and offshore MPA proposals for sand deals were, of course, consulted upon and have now been designated. And that does recognise, I hope, the, the importance of, of protecting those particular species. Uh, and as you said, because they're food for important seabird species as well. Uh, we've also designated several MPAs for sand and gravel habitats, which are, of course, also critical habitats for species such as sand eels, uh, including in the Firth of Forth, which you mentioned uh, as well. Clearly, the issue of sand eels has been an ongoing issue for many years in the conservation of sand eels. And we used to have the Danish vessels that came in and fished our, our stocks just off the, the shoreline in Scotland. But for the last few years, European restrictions have been in place over the sand eel fishery, which have been renewed year on year. So some of the conservation protection of sand eel populations at the moment come through the common fisheries policy and, and wider uh, European legislation. But because we are going through the process of designated MPAs, we thought it was important to listen to representations on that. And of course, that's, as I've just said, has led to designation of areas where there's sand deals. The gist of your question seems to be that is there a need for further action to protect sand deals? Because I'm not sure if that is the case. I think we have adequate protection in place now. I'm happy to take more scientific advice. Maybe colleagues will, will interject. But sand eel populations are influenced not just by predation, but also by climate change. And our, water, our water's warming affects where the, the sand eel populations are able to better breed, etc. So I'm not sure if any further protection over and above the MPAs and over and above the existing European uh, protection would make a material difference, to be honest. Uh, but I'm happy to take you know, more scientific advice on that. Uh, and I'll ask colleagues, are we aware of any 
need for further protection, I think, is with representations. Yes, um, really just to say that the uh, MPA proposals uh, that have been designated were designed to add value to existing protection and as uh, Mr Lockhead has outlined, um, there already is uh, action uh, taken by the European Union on the advice of ICES uh, to protect other populations of, uh, of sand eels in the North Sea and we will continue to keep uh, that ICES advice under review. Several people wanted to come in. Jim Hume, Graham Day, and then Claudia Beamish. Yes, thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning to, the, to you all again. Um, just regarding the, the first of fourth uh, banks, the three banks area, original, the original draft proposal was actually for one large bank to be, be an MPA area, which encompassed the, the three smaller ones that we do have now. now last uh, week we heard from the energy sector who we were concerned that the first banks being there at all, and uh, but the environmentalists were, were uh, obviously concerned that um, it wasn't the original larger uh, fourth bank. How much has this three smaller ones been driven by actual science, or how much has it been driven by trying to keep everybody happy? The, the decisions have been driven by science. Now, clearly, the the, the, the banks in the fourth that are being protected um, have been driven by science, but in terms of our whole approach to the MPA designations, of course we've had to work with all sectors, and in some cases only a small proportion of any MPA will actually directly impact on any particular industry. So in the case of the fourth banks, for instance, one of the concerns was the impact on renewables, where, as you know, in terms of the plans for offshore renewables, that's a key area that's been designated, and we're working on that just now. And therefore, the renewable energy sector, as you can imagine, we're paying close attention to what the designations may be for that area. That's why we had to be driven by the science, so we're not giving favouritism to any one particular industry, but we're having to balance various interests. So in terms of where we actually physically designate, we have to ensure we're protecting the features need protected and not designated areas that are larger than would otherwise be required by the science and vice versa we don't want to ignore those marine protected these marine features that do have to be protected so whilst the area that will be subject to the MPA may well overlap with some renewable energy developments that will have to take into account the designation now the actual percentage of the MPA area that would be affected will be tiny because you're talking about a management plan that will have to be put in place and that will be drawn up in the foreseeable future for that area. And the management plan will take into account where the features are within any MPA. Mm. So if, a, if you've got an MPA which has got multi-features, clearly there will be different parts of the MPA that will require different management options. I'm just trying to say here that MPA designation does not mean to say that everything that happens with the MPA will be affected by one decision or another within the management plan it will be tailored to the, the features within the, within the MPA. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully we've struck a balance there that will allow the renewable energy developments to proceed. They'll have to go through the various processes and the management plan will have to be taken into account, but we can have that balance of interests. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener, and good morning again, Cabinet Secretary, and good morning to um, the two officials as well. Um, we heard from Lloyd Austin of RSPB last week and from Professor Bob Furness that the Firth of Forth, as we've been <coughs> discussing already this morning, is a very important place for sand eels and seabirds. Um, and in fact, um, Professor um, Furness's work has produced many scientific papers on the subject. Uh, could I seek clarification from you, Cabinet Secretary, as to why um, the sand eels haven't been uh, noted as, as a specific feature in, in this MPA? And there, there are concerns which have been expressed about the fact that there isn't replication um, elsewhere in terms of um, protection. So um, you have made the point about the climate change as well as the fisheries, and I acknowledge that there's a fisheries closure there, but um, there are still concerns being voiced which have been um, expressed to me in the interim between the meetings as well. I wonder if we could sort of look into this a bit further. 
I'm happy to arrange for follow-up scientific note on Sandy to the committee because clearly there's a lot of interest in Sandy populations. But in terms of the designations, all I can say as a starting point is that there are existing protection for Sandy as I mentioned before, through European legislation. And we did designate on the basis of sand eels in terms of the habitats are conducive for the sand eels. Uh, I'm not quite sure what your question is about in terms of specific designation of sand eels within that as a feature. Um, as, I under, as I understand it, um, as a layperson on sand eels, yeah. <laughs> it, it may, I, I understand that they haven't been the specifically designated within that, um, that MPA as a feature. Uh, which is in need of protection and enhancement. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Well, I'll check that out. I'm not sure if David Mallon wants um, to contribute here in terms of how we got to that position. But. Yes, um, it's correct that sand eels isn't a protected feature of the first or fourth um, MPA. Uh, that is because, as uh, Mr Lockhead said, there already is protection in that area of the North Sea uh, for sand deals, and indeed we had you know, long discussions with uh, scientists in Marine Scotland Science about you know, what was the best uh, mix of features to protect in the first or fourth, and given the measures that are already in place under the Common Fisheries Policy and our wish to add value uh, through these designations, it was considered you know, not necessary uh, to add uh, sand deals to the mix of features that are protected in that site. Uh, just to kind of uh, expand on one of the, the points you uh, made in your, your question, there is in fact replication of sand deals uh, within the network. Uh, you know, we already have um, you know, uh, multiple sites for that feature. But you know, uh, MPA networks, um, uh, by virtue of the, the legislation uh, passed by Parliament, are about uh, an adaptive approach with regular review. And again, you know, that is something that we wish to keep under review. Uh, and the, the SBA proposals uh, that we have identified may also contribute to the, the broader protection of sand eels, given that uh, seabirds, amongst other species, uh, uh, depend upon sand eels. Through the convener, could I just come back briefly on, the, on that point? Uh, you, you, you mentioned, um, David, the, um, the common fisheries policy, and I, I acknowledge that there's fisheries closures um, in, within the context of this MPA that we're discussing and, and um, protection for sand eels. But um, in view of what the Cabinet Secretary is saying about climate change, um, is that really, is that EU designation, um, does the science show that the sand eels do not have to be recognised as a specific protected feature within this MPA to ensure their future protection at this stage? And if, if the science isn't clear enough, and I'm asking you if you can clarify if, if you think it is, would it be, um, is it something that could be reviewed uh, between now and 2016 when the, um, I think that's the date when the first review would happen? I was just going to add that as I said before, we'll make sure we get a scientific note uh, laying out the scientific case. Yeah. But clearly the thrust of the MP designation was the habitats yes. that are important to sand eels. But because of other factors affecting the sand eels, mm. you know, and for the reasons David and Alan gave there, mm. the scientists advised that we should just stick to the habitats. Uh, and the fisheries legislation comes from a purely conservation of fish stocks yeah. perspective, mm -hmm. not other factors. So... Uh, because of the issues surrounding sand eel stocks in the Firth of Forth, that protection has been in place for some time through the Common Fishers Policy, from a merely, from purely a, a stock conservation point of view. Uh, but I'm happy to make sure you get a scientific note just explaining the basis of the scientific advice we received. Right, that, that's much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Um, thinking about management principles, um, Claude, uh, sorry, Cara Hilton. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, looking to start with about how uh, marine protected um, areas are managed and enforced, um, given that there's just over two years to implement the MPA network, um, what are going to be, what's your priority is going to be in terms of the assessment, development and implementation of management measures, and how, how are you going to ensure that MPAs are more than just lines on, on the map? As you say, we have until the end of 2016 to put the management plans in place for the 30 MPAs, and the work has already begun on that. 
uh, there is a management handbook already available to give guidance as to the kind of options that are available for, for each MPA. We are very hopeful that a culture of compliance has been generated in Scotland. I think we all recognise that having 30 MPAs representing 20% of Scotland's waters does give you a challenge in terms of traditional policing and enforcement. Uh, clearly, you know, that's quite a challenge in itself given the nature of Scotland's waters. However, our experience from speaking to all the stakeholders and industries concerned is that we are all wanting to protect Scotland's precious marine features. And that's why we've had a good process in Scotland, because people are behind what we're trying to do. Already, in terms of the fishing industry, we have a number of voluntary measures that have been in place for the last uh, few months, where prior to the management plan we put in place, the fishing industry has agreed to put some voluntary measures in place. And that's a, 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 a hopeful sign. It's something I'm sure we all want to welcome, is the fact that fishermen recognise there is a change of activity that can take place in certain MPAs on a voluntary basis whilst we await the official management plan to be put in place before the end of 2016. So there will be enforcement measures. Clearly we have Marine Scotland's compliance and they have responsibility not just for fisheries protection but for the MPAs. And, you know, that will play a role in terms of our, our ships and our aircraft and the other resources we have. But it's not going to be achievable without the culture of compliance amongst all the users of Scotland's seas. But the main protection, the main protection against this just simply being lines on the map is, of course, its designations. Therefore, all the licensing authorities for anything that happens in their waters in the future have to take into account the designations. So that is, you know, that's the, the copper bottom guarantee that things are different from now on in that they're designated. Therefore, there's a legal requirement for these designations to be taken into account for future developments. And that will hopefully uh, uh, work well. And over and above that, we'll have the actual management plans themselves, which will, will lead to protect, protective measures being put in place in each, in each case. Angus MacDonald had a related question, I think, to link in with this just now. Yes, thank you, um, Convener. Uh, yeah, just picking up on the, the voluntary management uh, uh, measures that uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned. Um, <clears throat> as we've heard in, in evidence, uh, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation and the Western Isles Fishermen's Association, uh, in conjunction with uh, Marine Scotland, have implemented uh, voluntary measures, measures for three MPAs at South Arran, Wester Ross and Upper Loch Fyne. Uh, and of course, these voluntary measures are due to be replaced by statutory measures in, in due course. Um, but while there does seem to be a good sense uh, by the majority prevailing, uh, does the Cabinet Secretary feel that fishermen who are members of other associations uh, or uh, other unaffiliated uh, bodies are likely to stick to these measures? And if so, um, how will they be monitored and policed? Well, clearly we've done all we can to work with all the relevant interests that use Scotland's waters. And in terms of the fishing industry, we've gone to great lengths over the last few years to involve the fishing industry. We've very much relied on their expertise to understand the impact on fishing patterns. So without the input of the fishermen, we've been unable to, to deal with this properly because we get the, the intelligence from the fishermen of where their fishing patterns cross over with designated MPAs or, at that point in time, proposed MPAs. Uh, so I welcome that cooperation. Uh, I can only say that you know, we are so much further forward than we've ever been before. And the fact we do have this voluntary arrangement in place, which is relevant to 11 separate locations across three of the newly designated MPAs, uh, that's a very positive sign. I hope and I trust that all the fishermen, irrespective of which organisation they're a member of, will pay heed to these voluntary measures. There's other examples of voluntary measures in relation to fishing elsewhere in Scotland where all sectors have heeded them. They're not in relation to MPAs, they're in relation to other issues such as inshore fisheries. So the point here is that there's no reason to think that fishermen will not heed those voluntary measures irrespective of which fishing organisation actually get round the table to agree them. But, you know, the backstop is the management plan will be put in place in due course and there will be... Uh, 
uh, enforcement resources there to, to hopefully make sure that they, they are heeded. Um, but hopefully, because everyone's behind the thrust of what we're trying to do here, you know, the culture of compliance will will be there and work. Okay, thanks. I mean, clearly, we all we all hope that every single fisherman will adhere to the uh, the, the voluntary measures. Um, now, uh, Scottish Environment Link uh, have highlighted to the committee in, in some evidence uh, just this week that uh, two MPAs, the Small Isles and Wester Ross, uh, which uh, illustrate the stark differences between um, the features needing protection and the current management approach, um, need uh, cl close examination. For example, Link members have received feedback from within their own membership uh, expressing concern that the new MPAs are simply paper parks, as they, uh, to quote them, um, given that some damaging activities have been allowed to continue in newly designated MPAs. Uh, there's already been disappointment amongst coastal community groups that scallop dredging, for example, will, will continue within areas uh, of sites now designated for protection. Um, clearly, that's, that's a, an issue, and I'd be keen to hear what your views are on that. Sure. Well, let's return to the question about science. If there's scientific evidence that there is damage being caused, then the management plans will take that into account and respond to it, because we don't want damaging activity that will, you know, that will harm our marine features. So we have to the scientific evidence, and we don't. I'm, I'm not saying anyone in particular organisation is doing this. I'm just saying that clearly there's there's many perceptions that are always communicated to me by communities, by other fishermen, by uh, organisations that there's certain damaging activities taking place in different parts of Scotland. The first thing we always have to do is gather the scientific evidence that that actually is the case, because it's not the case that fishing activity per se causes damage. That is not the case. And in many of the MPAs, various types of fishing activity can continue without disruption because they don't cause damage. But in other cases where there is evidence that damage has been caused, then clearly the management plan will have to take that into account to stop that damage being caused. So there's no, there's no broad brush approach here or one size fits all way of approaching fishing in MPAs. Each case will be looked at in its merits. And in some cases, certain fishing activities will continue without disruption, but some may have to move elsewhere to avoid damage being caused. If there are examples out there of genuine damage being caused at the moment, I would want to hear about those. Clearly, as we put the management plans together, I would want to make sure we prioritise the management plans for those particular areas. So I would urge any organisation or MSP or this committee to give me those examples and we'll make sure that the management plans for those areas are absolutely prioritised. Okay, thanks. Um, Camille, I have an, an issue with regard to um, the, the, the existing fisheries closure areas. I don't know if you want me to raise that just now. Or... Follows. Okay, yeah, um, well, with regard to the, um, the, the seven, I believe, existing fisheries closure areas that are considered uh, to be contributing to the network, uh, but which aren't de designated as MPAs uh, for nature conservation under uh, Scottish or European legislation, uh, are these areas and uh, the features within them subject to equivalent safeguards and requirements uh, for monitoring, reporting and review as if they were designated MPAs? Because there is some concern uh, that as they're not designated as conservation sites under the, the definition of the Marine Scotland Act, uh, they'll not be managed, monitored, uh, reported and reviewed in the same way uh, as if they were fully fledged and MPAs. Can I just clarify, these areas are already subject to restrictions? Yes. Yeah. Well, clearly, <clears throat> we have various levels of protection already in place for Scottish waters. Usually, as you know, emanating from Europe via the Habitats Directives or via uh, the Common Fishes Policy or Special Protected Areas designations or, or whatever. They will all form, form part of the network of MPAs in Scotland. Uh, the areas we're designating are often areas of multi-features, which introduce a new form of designation because they would have not otherwise been designated. But existing special protected areas, etc., will form part of the overall network of areas in Scotland, which will comprise the designations that are in place already through Europe or the MPAs we're designating in terms of 30 MPAs. And that together will lead to a big network around Scottish waters of protection. So those areas where there's already restrictions, no one should have any fear 
that there's going to be some sort of lighter touch approach to those areas because they will be subject to protection at the moment. And earlier on, we discussed the existing protection for sand eel populations in the Firth of Forth, and that's legislation that's in place, it's passed by Parliament, to close the fisheries for sand eels in those particular areas. So that's not light touch, that's, that's legislation passed by this Parliament that closes those areas via the common fisheries policy. MPAs, of course, are more likely to address multi-features and a much wider variety of features than what European legislation does, which are very specific usually to one species or in the case of fisheries uh, protection in relation to one stock. Okay. Right. Okay. On uh, management principles, Jim Hume. Yes, I'm just looking on. Uh, quite neatly from that. Uh, part of the key policies of the, the handbook state that it's uh, to use the best available scientific information, and you've mentioned uh, that scientific information has been used for the fourth banks, it's been used for decisions on, on, on where people would dredge scallops or not. But of course, um, best available scientific information might not necessarily be good science, and we had that from some of our uh, witnesses last week and also heard from one of the en energy uh, representatives last week that quite often the, the evidence they have are, is evidence actually done by energy sector when they're doing their environmental assessments themselves which are passed on to government and some of them are of course commercially sensitive and therefore can't be broadened out. So uh, just wondering what, what your thoughts are on the difference between the best available scientific information, information and actual good science, and is this robust enough to ensure that we are actually meeting good environmental standards? As a society, we, are, we have more knowledge than ever before of what lies beneath the waves in Scottish waters, and that has been huge progress over the past few years alone, given the actual work that's taken place as a result of the Marine Scotland Act, but clearly over uh, the last few decades, given Scotland has a lot of expertise in marine science, and we mentioned SAMS earlier on, and the good work that's been happening there, and, you know, Marine Scotland science, of course, plays a, a crucial role in that. We take our advice from the GNCC, so SNH, SEPA, Marine Scotland science, and, as I said before, uh, the other organisations in Scotland have all been working together to build up Scotland's scientific knowledge of, of our marine features. It's not complete, of course it's not, and there's still I'm sure a long way to go, and we know we've got four uh, search locations that we're going to be bringing forward for consultation in terms of future MPAs, etc., uh, for mobile species, so we're still building up our scientific knowledge, you know, in some areas. <coughs> But we're confident that we've got enough scientific knowledge and good enough scientific knowledge to designate the 30 MPAs we've mentioned today. There's always a debate around science and how accurate it is, but you have to take the precautionary approach and use what scientific knowledge you do have and base your decisions on that. Because the alternative is not taking any decisions and not making any designations. Mm -hmm. So we're confident that we've got enough scientific knowledge. Ironically, of course, you mentioned the renewable energy sector and the knowledge base built up by offshore renewables has been fantastic as well, so that's gone into the mix and helped us greatly understand things. So Scotland's made huge uh, leaps in terms of scientific knowledge, marine scientific knowledge, in the last few years, and I'm confident we've got a good basis in which to take decisions. Well, thanks very much for that. But just to, to follow on that, it's, it's obviously it's not just the, the big energy companies that are perhaps finding out uh, the science, but also uh, we had evidence that um, amateur naturalists, if you like, were actually found out about the Merrill beds, to give an example of, of Aaron. Therefore, I just wonder how, how quickly um, organisations like yourself, the government, can react to new information that comes in from either the big energy companies or from uh, amateur naturalists who find out new information, because for sure we're, we're more knowledgeable than we, than we were yesterday, but uh, there's a lot of sea out there, as, as we all know. We do take into account information we get from local communities, and one of the reasons why we were keen to have, as part of the MPA designation process, community-driven MPAs, is because we want to hear the views of communities. Clearly, 
when we hear from communities about marine features that they want to protect and propose for MPAs. Of course, we have to have you know, official scientific investigation to make sure what we're, we're hearing is accurate. Yeah. But in terms of bringing those special areas of our marine features to our attention, we you know, built that into the process. And a number of the MPAs that came forward and that were finally designated originally originated from third parties. So not from government uh, and not from our own scientific institutions, but perhaps from environmental organisations or in the case of Aaron, local communities. So the process, I think, is very open to allow proposals to come from outside of government and outside of the official channels. Uh, clearly, you have to check the science and make sure it's underpinned by uh, verified science, but uh, that, that's worked. Uh, no, thanks for that. I mean, you, you talked more about what has been and where we are now. I was thinking of the future and, you know, uh, future discoveries, if you like, of our seabeds. How quickly can the government react to new discoveries of, of uh, natural information regarding the seabeds? Well, clearly, in terms thanks. of the reporting mechanism to Parliament, we have to have the management options in place, or management plans in place by the end of 2016, and then 2018 is the next deadline for reporting back to Parliament on progress with the MPAs. So behind that lies a lot of work. So we have all our scientists in Scotland working <coughs> together, and they have open channels and liaison with communities and environmental organisations. So there's ample opportunity for people to feed in scientific discoveries or knowledge to that process. It's a very open process. And as I said before, the evidence that's working is that some of our MPAs that have been designated have originated from third parties. Okay, thanks. Um, Dave Thompson wanted a supplementary on that. Yeah, thank you very much, convener. It's as much a comment as a supplementary, I suppose. I mean, I agree, obviously, with what Jim Hume's saying there. You know, that if, if, if metal beds or whatever are discovered, um, then we need to make sure that they're protected. But the very fact that they've been discovered actually shows that they haven't been destroyed. So they, they're there and have been, I don't know how long it takes to establish uh, such a bed, but if they're there just now with all the commercial activity that's going on just now, then the conservation's already happening in the sense that uh, our fishermen and others haven't destroyed these things. So if they are there, that's actually a very positive thing in relation to the fact that we have these, these, these beds. Uh, and, you know, I think we need to be careful. We need, I think we need to um, accept and, and realise that the folk who are fishing our seas have just as much interest in making sure that the environment is good, you know, in relation to how they make their living. I'm not saying they're all perfect or whatever, but uh, we shouldn't just go rushing in to designate something every time we find something, unless it's very, very particularly precious. But remember that it's there, despite the commercial activity that's been going on for centuries. It's a very good point, and it links into the previous question from Jim Hume about how we take into account local knowledge and local input to science because often the users of our seas are the people with the local knowledge and know which areas to avoid so they don't cause damage. But notwithstanding that, of course, there are areas that have been damaged and we are aware of that and therefore that's why there's a justification for this whole new approach to marine conservation. And of course, we'll never know, I guess, what was there previously that's not there now. Uh, so we can only work with the information we've got, but you're quite right, you know, the fact that we have so many special marine features beneath our waves in Scottish waters uh, shows that it is possible for marine activity and industries to work side by side with marine conservation. Mike Ferguson had another supplementary in this. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's about the, the, the robustness of the scientific evidence that's been used in, in drawing up the, the plans. Um, uh, uh, Angus MacDonald mentioned um, quite rightly that LINK members have apparently received you know, fairly damning feedback that, that um, some of them view the new MPAs as paper parks, as, as he quoted. And, and that's quite quite robust sort of opposition. And I just wonder how, um, whether some of that uh, quiet, if you like, is brought about by situations where perhaps the, the scientific 
evidence that is available hasn't maybe been used to the fullest in drawing up the, ma the management zones. And I would refer you to um, Scottish Natural Heritage's Commission Report 764 on the Upper Loch Fine and Loch Goyle MPAs and Wester Ross MPA, which shows um, a, a fairly typical example of what I'm trying to get at, which is, again, a mole bed, uh, identified mole bed, um, but which lies out with the, the area that's targeted for management. Now, that obviously gives rise um, to a concern that, well, why, you know, the scientific evidence is there that it exists, but it hasn't been taken into account when drawing up the area for management. I just wondered whether you, wanted to com whether you could comment on that. Yes, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. I just want to address your, your comment about paper parks, NPAs being paper parks. And I just want to recap on the process of how we got to where we are today. And the, 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 the big feature of public policy now in relation to marine conservation is designations. So the most important aspect to bear in mind is that we are designating. Then it's followed by management. But designation in itself is an acknowledgement that they are very important features. That is, that's the, the, the backdrop to all of what we're talking about is designation. Society has investigated, discovered, and now designated. That's a special feature, feature we want to protect. Now, in some cases, there'll be no activity in those MPAs. Mm -hmm. So the management plan, you know, I don't know, I, you know what it looked like, but it won't be as detailed as a management plan where there's lots of activity. So quite clearly, a paper MPA, uh, people might think, well, that's designated, but nothing's going to change. But the mere fact it's designated protects it from future activities which would have to be licensed and pay attention to the fact it's designated. So designation in itself is a very important point to bear in mind here. And therefore, many of the MPAs will not have much activity at all. Many are far out at sea with very little activity, not even any fishing activity. So call them paper MPAs. Obviously, it's a disparaging comment, but there's not going to be a lot of evidence of change activity because there's no activity in the first place. In terms of where there is activity, the management plans that are going to be put together will be, be based on scientific advice. And clearly, someone looking at an MPA or an area of sea that's been designated an MPA and sees some activity will think, well, hold on a minute, that's an MPA, but I can still see that activity. Well, clearly, the, 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 the challenge is to make sure we've got scientific evidence that that activity that's been witnessed is damaging the marine environment. So pelagic fisheries, for instance, don't damage marine features. And you may see a fishing vessel which is fishing for, for pelagic stocks, uh, you know, which swim near the surface of the water. And uh, the assumption from the bystander may be oh, there's lots of activity happening in that MPA, but of course there's no scientific evidence whatsoever that activity is damaging, is damaging the marine features. So everything will be backed up with science. In terms of the question about some features being identified that are not in the MPAs, um, I'll ask David Mallon to come in because he's closely involved in, in the, the process. But clearly, the original approach to this was if you had several uh, features that were replicated in various sites, uh, we had to make sure the features were protected by at least protecting one of those sites mm -hmm. so that the feature is protected. As, a, as you know, an example of what's in our waters. If there was various locations all over the place with the same feature, it was built into the original process that you know, the absolute bottom line was some of those areas had to be protected, not necessarily all of them, but some of them. I don't know if you want to come in. Uh, yeah, on that. No, just, I mean, I do, I do understand yep. that. I, I merely mentioned it as an example of perhaps why some people have less faith in the scientific. Uh, that processes have been used that, that, that you suggest they have been. You know, um, it's not me that's calling them a, a um, paper parks. It, it, it's others. You know, and uh, so I merely use that as an example of why perhaps people are questioning the, the use of the science that is available in drawing up the management. Zone. Okay, and maybe that's just an, is an issue of getting the information out there in the decision making process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right back at the beginning of this journey, of course, we recognised our waters are used for all kinds of activities and a lot of economic activity. So we had to have that balance. And there are some people who would no doubt like no economic activity in our waters because it could potentially cause pollution or damage. Society doesn't take that view. Society takes the view that we need the economic activity, but we have to protect our marine environment and strike that balance. And that's why we're now much further forward than we were before. Okay, no, I'm happy with that. Thank you. Very good. Um, Claudia Beamish. Thank 
you, Convener. Um, could I uh, develop these arguments that we've been having in relation to management of MPAs uh, a bit further, Cabinet Secretary? Um, last week, I think it was, we heard from uh, Lloyd Austin of the RSPB um, that MPAs are designed, uh, sorry, desig the MPAs designated are not yet ecologically coherent, meaning efforts must be redoubled to ensure this network delivers for the environment, industry and communities. Um, and I wonder the degree to which um, the, they really, it, it really is an ecologically coherent network. Um, we heard in evidence last week as well that it was necessary to have management objectives for whole sites, and we have touched on this, but um, I, I'm puzzled as to how if a whole site isn't designated, how um, enforcement will be taken as to, as to protecting the features that are there that need protection? Well, clearly, <clears throat> we're going to do our best to get this right. And in 2018, we report back to Parliament on what progress is being made. And lessons will be learned. Of course there will be. This is the mm. first time we've ever done this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully at some point in 20 or 30 years, people look back and think we've got a great system in place that, you know, it was developed over time. But this is the first time we're doing this, so we will learn lessons. But MPAs can be relatively large areas of sea. And within that large area of sea, there'll be multi-features, different features. Now, they'll be mapped out and the coordinates will be available. And that's how, you know, I guess it'll be mm -hmm. uh, enforced and policed. But that's why the management plan will have to address the, the, the various features within those MPAs. And that's why you're not just going to have necessarily the same management plan or, or the same uh, measures within the management plan applying to all parts of the MPA. Um, I think, you know, to put things in perspective, I think if you look at the fishing area of the, the Flavins, where that's a huge area of the North Sea, but the actual part of it that will actually be subjected to measures will be something like 1% or something. You know, it's, we mustn't get carried away with huge areas of sea being subjected to really big restrictions. Uh, the management plans will take into account the actual activities and which features are being protected within the, each MPA. Right, Cabinet Secretary, so, so the, the, is the clear possibility that all the, you're, you're reassuring me, I take it, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, yeah. but, but that, that the features and the habitats which they thrive in um, within a marine protected area, even if the whole uh, area isn't managed, either because it's a very large area or for other reasons, that that will be still enforceable. Yes, I mean, we're clearly, as I said before, we're on a, a learning curve here. Yeah. And until the management plans are put in place and reflect on how successful they are, mm -hmm. you know, we can't fully answer those kinds of questions. But the key is we're doing it, and we're doing it for the first time, and absolutely confident the outcome will be greater protection. Right, thank you. And, and could you also explain how the ecologically coherent network will be developed in relation not just to stopping further degradation of our marine environment, but um, enhanced and recovery, which aren't words that, in, in my, my own view, we hear enough of um, in relation to the marine environment? Well, that's one of the trickiest debates, is defining recovery, because we will have to recognise that we do want clearly some marine features to recover, mm -hmm. but then that begs the question, recover to what? And some MPAs we are hoping and expecting to recover naturally. So that's, you know, that's quite challenging to lay down uh, rules and regulations within the management plans in relation to recovery, because you'd have to define recovery as I said before, recover to what? Now, clearly, we'll be guided by the science, and that will be an ongoing um, exercise. So recovery is an objective, but in terms of how you lay down within the management plans and define recovery of any particular site is a bit more challenging. And, and on enhancement, which I believe is part of the um, commitments within the Marine Act, enhancement of our marine environment. Again... Well. You know, all I can say is the management plans are going to be guided by the science. Mm -hmm. 
the management plans are going to be substantial documents applied to each MPA in Scotland. So we'll have 30 management plans and they'll be guided by the science. Um, Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Kavina. We, 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 we heard some evidence, and indeed we've had written evidence to su that suggests that there, if, if this network is to be ecologically coherent, um, further MPAs or further designations will need to be added. Um, do, do you agree? I mean, well, do you agree with that? Does the 2018, when this comes back to Parliament in 2018, will that allow an opportunity? for further designations and areas to be added if it's believed to be necessary in order to deliver what Parliament asked for under the Marine Scotland Act? Or do you think that this network as proposed is it? No, this is certainly not it. There's no doubt that we will be continuing to learn more about Scotland's seas and our marine features. And the more we build up that scientific knowledge, the more MPAs will be designated, no doubt, in due course. Who knows where they'll be, how many there will be, I've already given an indication we're looking at mobile species at the moment in terms of some of the search locations that are being looked at, mm -hmm. which will lead, no doubt, to future designations of the mobile species. So there are very likely, of course, to be more MPAs, and Parliament will have a duty to keep reflecting and reporting. And as I said, the next deadline for that is 2018. 2018. Thank you very much. Thinking about the resources that there are available to uh, extend our knowledge and indeed to uh, also regulate these things. Um, are there adequate resources in place to underpin the role of the regulators and the scientists? Given the huge progress we've made with the science Sorry. in the run-up to the designations and indeed the resources we put in to make sure that we can get the management plans in place, so far, there has been adequate resources. It's always a challenge, given the wider financial considerations. So that's something we'll have to keep under review, convener, is in terms of us moving forward to make sure we have the resources available. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a huge challenge, even getting the 30 management plans in place by the end of 2016. So we'll keep the resources under review. We have given extra funds towards the various surveys to get the designations in place. And future budget decisions will take into account the need to, to keep up the momentum. Well, I'm particularly interested in these decisions because we've maintained uh, scientific research in the budgets, you know, to, to a degree which, uh, you know, is laudable in the Scottish budget. That's really important. But, uh, you know, the work of SAMS, uh, the work of uh, the Environmental Research Institute, in Thurso, which is looking at all aspects of life in the Pentland Firth in particular, all require a, a kind of guarantee that there will be a flow of cash to these. Um, is that something which you see as a, an expanding role for the science and research that we, we can afford? Or have we even uh, uh, adequately looked at the costs that will be required to extend that knowledge at the moment? Some of these decisions are very long term. Um, I'm, I'm content there's adequate resources made available at the moment for what's required in the short term. And as you indicated, we've done our best to protect the science budgets in Scottish Government, despite some of the big cuts we've had to take. There have been efficiency savings and the budgets have not increased for uh, Marine Scotland. Uh, within Marine Scotland, there has been a reallocation of resources, but in terms of the lower Marine Scotland's uh, budget, I'm not going to sit here and say we've increased it because we've had to have quite um, hard efficiency savings. But in terms of overall budget cuts compared to what's happened elsewhere in the UK, we've managed to protect the budgets as, as far as we can. One great boost to scientific knowledge in Scotland, of course, is from the private sector. We have to remember the oil and gas sector commissions a lot of environmental work and science and of course the offshore renewable sector because they also have to go through the environmental assessments for any of their projects and plans they have invested a lot in, in science so a lot of our scientific institutions in Scotland are benefiting from private sector investment um, the resources include those for the regulators now, uh, now that Marine Scotland has got responsibility both for fishing and for uh, the marine protection as well. Um, 
are the ships and aircraft that you have adequate to the task? Well, one of the changing roles of Marine Scotland over the last uh, few years, indeed with the advent of Marine Scotland itself, we used to have the Scottish Fishers Protection, is that our vessels now have a wider remit, not just Fishers Protection, but marine, um, marine responsibility as well in terms of uh, these designations, etc. So we have to keep that under review. We've got three ships, we've got two aircraft, uh, we have our staff, and we have various other uh, vessels, uh, clearly ribs, smaller vessels, which are attached to the, the, the ships that are used for more inshore uh, activity. So we have to keep that under review. Uh, it does, of course, emphasise that we are very reliant on the culture of compliance we spoke about before. If we don't have everyone on board to make this work, it will be challenging. So we have to work with people to make sure that we're all going in the same direction, that all the users of Scotland Seas want to protect our marine features. We can't rely simply on hard enforcement all the time, that's not going to be the best way of delivering our objectives. But we will keep that under review. Thank you. Nigel Don. Thank you, Kevin. Just exploring that, I'm, I'm grateful. Callum Duncan of the Marine Conservation Society last week spoke about citizen science. And, um, clearly there are a lot of very capable people around who observe all sorts of things and report them accordingly. Does the government have any particular perspective on how that can be encouraged? I'm always open to suggestions of how that can be encouraged and perhaps it's something we should give a lot more thought to. All I would say is that we have gone to great pains, as indicated before, to ensure that our work to date has been very open and transparent and invited contributions mm -hmm. from outside of the official channels and from outside of government. So while science has to be validated, you have to have authoritative validation of science in terms of influencing that agenda and inputting to it, we are very, very keen on supporting what is referred to as citizen science in terms of highlighting issues and inputting to the process. Mm -hmm. okay. And I just add that the process north of the border has been highly commended compared to the rest of the UK in terms of approaching our designations and approaching the Marine Scotland Act and everything around that. We've been very inclusive mm -hmm. and I'm not, sure, I'm not saying everything's perfect but uh, we've had a lot of feedback and comment publicly that the process, and I think your committee had that in the last, the last week or two, it's a very inclusive process we've had in Scotland. Yep. Thanks. Just how inclusive I think uh, Graham Day wants to explore just a moment before we... Yeah, uh, thank you, you. Yeah, My question is really on the uh, practicalities uh, which can arise with implementing MPAs. Uh, Mick Borwell of Oil and Gas UK uh, raised a concern with the committee over one particular management uh, measure at a site level, which was namely that uh, deposited material should meet local habitat type. Now, he read that as meaning that on a mud or a sand seabed devoid of rocks, no rocks could be place there. I think his point was that the industry uses rocks to stabilise pipelines, both to protect the content and as a safety measure for the, the fishing fleet. And I'm wondering, is the concern potentially warranted or is there scope for common sense solutions to be found in such specific circumstances? Well, on the one hand, the designations are there to protect. Mm. So if the scientific evidence is that using one particular material in one particular location would endanger a marine feature we want to protect, then clearly uh, that's not going to be accepted and the licence will not be granted for the particular pipeline and the analogy you give. But the system's also designed to ensure that this is not about stopping development at sea. It's just ensuring they're appropriate and they're in the right locations mm -hmm. and that there's a management plan put in place for any development that does take place to take into account the marine features. So it's not about stopping things. It's just been ensuring they don't damage the marine environment. That may mean moving it, or it may mean doing it in a different way, or whatever. Uh, but that's why, once the designation is in place and the management plans are put in place, clearly anyone wanting to lay a pipeline on Scotland's seabed will have to apply for a licence. And the authority that grants that licence has to refer to the designations. So in reality, they would have to find a different means of, of securing any pipeline if permission was to be granted. If that feature is protected, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the clarity on that. Okay. Um, thank you. Nigel Don, uh, about uh, further designations. Any yes, thank you very much. Any other points on that? 
Uh, it's an issue which we picked up on uh, last week. I understand that there are further four marine protected areas that have been, as it were, thought about already assessed, but um, were not designated. Uh, this is of particular interest to those who are concerned about dolphins, for example, um, who seem to be particularly uh, covered by these areas. And I'm not sure, and I don't think anybody else is particularly sure, what the process is, whether they're being consulted on, when they will be designated, timetables, certainty. I think this, that, 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 that's broadly the question, Cabinet Secretary. Can you, can you enlighten us, please? So clearly we are very lucky in Scottish waters. We have some special species of whales, dolphins, basking sharks, etc. And uh, they are spectacular species and we want to do what we can to protect those species when they're in Scottish waters. But by the very nature, they're mobile species. Therefore, in terms of designating MPAs to protect those species, it's a lot more challenging mm -hmm. than static features. That's why it's taking longer. Our hope is to consult on, on those four MPAs in 2015. Right. But clearly, as I said before, the scientific justification for any particular MPA is taking a bit longer because they're mobile species. We have to understand where the breeding grounds are, etc. And once we're confident that we've got that information and it forms the basis of designating MPAs for mobile species, then we'll consult. And as I said before, we've announced, as you said, four potential MPAs, and 2015 is the target date for consulting. So uh, I understand the point about the science, and clearly if, if, if creatures move around, it's a tad yeah. difficult to work out where they prefer to be most of the time. Uh, I'm sure the scientific community would accept that. Is there any other constraint than good science on simply getting those designated as soon as possible? Well, it's, it's August 2014 at the moment, and I'm mm -hmm. saying we'll consult in 2015, so... I think most people I've spoken to understand the, the reasons why it's taking a bit longer mm -hmm. to get those MPAs in place. And the consultation will be 2015, and thereafter we will get the designations in place as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Claudia Beamish, a little further on the process. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Scottish planning policy in paragraph... Um, uh, 210, I understand, states, um, and I quote, authorities should afford the same level of protection to proposed SACs and SBAs, i.e. sites have been approved by Scottish ministers for formal consultation but have not yet been designated, as they do to sites which have been designated. I wonder if you could um, comment on um, whether these draft um, SPAs should be, in fact, be considered as proposed SPAs and treated as if they've been designated for the planning process. Right, that's quite a complicated question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's really whether, whether, because they have been proposed, they, they, can receive some, they can receive protection in, while the process is going on um, of consultation until a, a possible designation. Well, at the moment, in terms of our SPAs, as you know, there's 14 locations that are being proposed. Yeah. And again, we're going to consult on those in 2015. Is your question that we should somehow put measures in place before the official designation? Yeah, well, Mike, it, it's a question because I understand in um, Scottish planning policy, uh, and I quoted the paragraph for you, which um, highlights this, this issue that when, once something has been proposed, um, uh, that at the time of, of, formal des of formal consultation, but of not being designated, um, they, they could have protection. I'll reflect on that because the process is already underway for the mm -hmm. specific SPAs we're speaking about. As I said before, there's 14 of yeah. them. And I will have to check with the uh, authorities to understand if there's protection in place at the moment, mm -hmm. albeit not in a statutory footing. Right. Um, but the process has been followed for those 14 SPAs are no different to the existing SPAs already in place in Scottish waters. Mm -hmm. So there's no difference in terms of the way they've been treated. But I'll certainly check that point and get back to the committee. That would be helpful. And, and just on, on the point of the seabird protection, 
um, would you be able to, or it's an even more difficult question, and I certainly don't know the answer to it, but would you be able to comment on whether um, you would see the um, network and, and protection for seabirds as moving towards completion um, once these areas, um, whichever areas are designated, have been designated, on the best available science at the moment? You know, obviously in the future it may be different, but would you see it as, as quite robust after this? Yes, I mean, it's always dangerous for me to say that something's completed. <laughs> yes. uh, however, clearly the 14 areas we've proposed have been warmly welcomed and we're quite confident that will take us much further forward and address those areas where concerns have been expressed where there's a lack of protection. Mm -hmm. Again, as you said yourself, we'll be guided by scientific knowledge, so if more science becomes available in the future, we'll have to respond to that in due course. I don't you want to comment the process. Uh, yes, um, the, the fact of the matter, I think, the experience from um, SBAs um, on land is that uh, there is a need to keep under review uh, whether the, the sites are sufficient to meet the, the needs of the, the populations of the, the bird species. And I, I think that's Did likely to be the case uh, in the marine environment as well. And these are the sites, uh, the site proposals which SNH and JNCC have been able to identify. Um, we'll have to keep that under review, as uh, Mr Lockhead says, and uh, the 2018 review is uh, the first opportunity to do that. Uh, similar to the, the other features which are contained in the network. Uh, and, uh, and there are some features which SNH and GNCC had originally sought out to represent, which uh, data, you know, evidence wasn't available for, and, and those will be ones which will be actively uh, keeping under review as well. Right, thank you. Th well, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. It's obvious that we're on a kind of escalator. We learn more as we go along. Uh, we're at a particular point now where we've made the first major pioneering move uh, that's been warmly welcomed by many people. And uh, we're in a position that uh, we hope that uh, the learning process will allow uh, people to take on board uh, the science that's been gleaned and to apply science to make sure that uh, these MPAs work. Uh, from local communities' point of view, the increase in their involvement uh, in this process uh, will be very important, along with the inshore fishery groups and so on. So we hope that you're able to sort of um, make all of these things work together and fit the jigsaw together so that we have uh, clean seas and improving environments. And thank you very much to you and your officials for uh, your evidence today. Uh, but before closing, um, I'd like to say that uh, this is the last committee meeting before the independence referendum. Though we've only been back for a short while, the committee's covered some important work on uh, both uh, MPAs and on re regard to tenant uh, farming. And I'd like to thank all those who've given evidence and worked with us both in front of and behind the scenes. So I'll close the meeting now and thank you for your attendance. Thank you.